And good evening and welcome. I am Councillor Dennis Bennyworth, Chairman of the Western Area Planning Committee. Members of the committee joining me this evening are Councillors Adrian Abs, Phil Barnett, Jeff Kant, Hilary Cole, Caroline Culver, Clive Hooker, Andy Moore, who's substituting for Vice Chairman Tony Vickers, uh, and Howard Wollaston. The following officers are attending to advise and support the meeting. Mr. Simon Till, the team leader of Western Area Planning Committee. Uh, Mr. Masi Masiwa, Senior Planning Officer. Ms. Cheyenne Kirby, Planning Officer. Mr. Paul Goddard, Highways Officer. Uh, this is Kim Ma, Legal Advisor. And Mr. Jack Karimi, the Clerk. I'm also assisted by Ms. Melanie Booth as the Zoom host. Before we start proceedings, I'd like to explain for the benefit of members of the public who may be watching that tonight's meeting is being held both over Zoom and with councillors present and COVID compliant in the council chamber. I can confirm that those present in the chamber are sitting socially distanced and are thus permitted to remove their face masks while seated. Parish council representatives, supporters, objectors, and the applicant or agent making a presentation to the committee have been encouraged to do so remotely via Zoom. However, they can also choose to attend in person or remotely from within the Market Street building, for example, from the reception or the Roger Croft room or from any public device in any location. The meeting is fully accessible, both physically and remotely for any member of the public. The meeting is being live streamed on YouTube, so members of the public are able to follow proceedings. Please note, there's a small delay between the live meeting and the stream session. Now some housekeeping for those in the chamber. Please ensure that your mobile is on silent. We're not anticipating any fire alarm tests tonight. So if the fire alarm does sound, please leave via the council chamber, uh, please leave the council chamber using the fire exits to the far right and convene in the Dolphin car park. Do members have any questions about the way in which the meeting will be conducted before we proceed? Item one, um, before we receive any apologies, in the absence of the vice chairman, uh, Councillor Vickers, I'm proposing that the committee appoint a temporary vice chair for the meeting. Uh, under rule 7.6.2 to appoint a chairman of the committee, if the, vice, the chairman or vice chairman of a committee or subcommittee are absent, I propose the motion to elect Councillor Hilary Cole as vice chairman. Does this motion find a seconder? Councillor Hooker, thank you very much. Uh, I'll take a vote, please, for the show of hands. That's unanimous. Thank you, members. Uh, Mr. Karimi, have we received any apologies this evening, please? Uh, Councillor Tony Vickers has sent his apologies. Councillor Andy Moore is attending as a substitute. Thank you very much, Mrs. Moore. Declarations, can I Okay, on to item two. Okay. Councillor Marsh, nice to see you. Uh, but I'm just wondering if you could uh, cancel the video until it's uh, until you're on. Thank you, Councillor Hooker. Um, item two, uh, minutes. Members, do you have any observations of the minutes, please? We'll take them in turn, minutes of the first of September. No one, I'm going to um, just point out um, under the councillors present, uh, Councillor Lynn Doherty was uh, credited with being here. I don't know that she was actually part of the committee that day. So um, other than that, I have no other amendment to make. So if we're happy with that, um, I'll take a show of hands that we I'll propose that the minutes are a true record. The show of hands. Thank you very much. Thank you.
And moving on to the minutes of the 22nd of September. Members, do you have any, any comment on those? I'd like to propose then that they are a true record of the meeting. Does that find a seconder? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. And a show of hands, please. That's... I wasn't present, Chairman, so I'm abstaining. Thank you very much, Councillor Abs. Chairman, the same for me. Russell Wilson, thank you. Okay, on to item number three now, declarations of interest. Do any members wish to make a declaration of interest? Councillor Apps. Uh, yes, Chairman, the second item is uh, within my ward, um, so, and I have been lobbied as such, uh, as, a, as a ward member. Noted. Thank you very much. Councillor Culver. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I also have been lobbied on item two. Thank you very much. Councillor Barnett. I've also been lobbying on council um, uh, the um, running order item number two um, for members that are not aware. I am a member of Newby Town Council and also a member of the Planning and Highways Committee of Newby Town Council, uh, where, of course, this particular item was discussed. Um, but tonight, obviously, I shall weigh up all the evidence and vote accordingly on the evidence that's put in for forward in front of us. Thank you. Councillor Barnett, thank you very much. Councillor Moore. Um, I'm also a member of the Planning and Highways Committee of Newbury Town Council. Same, same applies. That's noted. Thank you very much. Um, um, forgive me, Chairman. Um, I've also been canvassed on item two. Thank you very much. I'd like to uh, say also that I've been canvassed on items one and three, uh, but we'll look at each of these with a fresh pair of eyes and come to my conclusion uh, after the debate. Okay, moving on to, I do apologise, it is indeed. Um, Councillor Wilson. I've been lobbied on item two and I, by the, an objector, and uh, item three fills, falls within my ward, and I've been lobbied, lobbied by both sides of the argument. That's noted, Councillor Wilson, thank you very much. Any further declarations? Thank you, members. Uh, item four, uh, the first of our applications this evening. Uh, uh, 21 stroke 01519 stroke full, land west of pumping station, Enborn Row, Washwater, Newbury. Um, for the benefit of those watching, I'll briefly outline the format of each application. Officers, officers will present the application to the committee. The drawing, site plans, and any deemed relevant materials submitted on the planning file will be shown as part of that presentation, after which rep representations can be made from each of the following groups and in this order. Parish or town council representatives, objectors, supporters, the applicant and or agent, and then finally ward members. Speakers will be invited to join the meeting in order, either by Zoom or in this room. Each speaker or group of speakers will have a maximum total of five minutes to make their case to the committee. Therefore, a group of speakers will need to agree a way of sharing their time allocation. It would be useful to do this now if you've not done so already. Following this, the committee members will then have the opportunity to ask questions of clarification of the speakers. Finally, committee members will have the opportunity to ask questions of clarification of the officers. The committee will then debate the application and vote on the decision. There are three applications on the agenda for this evening. The one I've just mentioned, which is item number one, Land Western Pumping Station, Enborn Row, Washwater, Newbury. Item two, uh, 21 stroke 01038 stroke house number one Croft Road Newbury and item number three uh, which is 20 stroke 01264 stroke full madge Fogman Farm Upper Lambourne in Hungerford. Uh, starting with the first application land west of pumping station Enborn Row Washwater Newbury. Uh, Miss Cheyenne Kirby planning officer would you like to begin your presentation please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I will just share my screen for you. Uh, 
Uh, can I confirm that you can see that? Uh, nothing as yet, Ms. Gerber. Oh. Okay, can you see that now? Uh, we've got just the normal uh, Zoom Zoom screen, the Rogues Gallery on on screen at the moment. It says it's sharing. We're we're good now. We're good now, Miss Kirby. Oh, you can see it. Great. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Um, so this is Land West of Pumping Station, Embon Row, Wash Water. Um, this application is the second time this has been to committee. The previous application um, was very similar. Um, however, it had less land. Since then, the applicant has come back in um, due to purchase of additional land. Um, this is for change of use of agricultural to equestrian um, construction of stabling and hard standing and soft landscaping scheme. This was a member call in, and it has, uh, if you've received your update sheet today, it's now um, approval um, subject to uh, compliance with additional SUDS information. Um, as you can see on the screen, here's the location plan. Um, previously, the land was 0 0.4 hectares, and now it is 0 0.7 hectares. Um, the application will include a small stable block, which will have two loose boxes and a feed store slash attack room, as well as two par car parking spaces um, and manure skip um, and separation into individual for paddocks for two children's ponies. Um, on the screen now is um, an image, uh, is the plans of the proposed stable block. Um, this is the current entrance to the site. Um, since, our pre since the previous application, the applicant has worked hard on improving the quality of the land because that was a concern that was raised um, at the previous committee meeting. So this is the entrance, the current entrance to the site. The view of the site from the from the main road. Um, and this is the road heading east. Um, and the view across the site. Um, whilst the application is below the recommended British Horse Society standards, um, it does say um, in the standards that this is it's one zero point five to one hectare per ho horse, um, but this is permanent grazing. Uh, this application is not for ponies to be on permanent grazing, but to be uh, supplemented with hard feed and forage. Um, therefore, um, the to this is below the standard which we have deemed acceptable. Um, previously, there was concern about children riding on the road, um, which is why the, uh, which was the second refusal reason. Um, as stated previously, this is beyond um, the matter of planning, um, and the highways officer di uh, did recommend approval subject to conditions. Uh, back to you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Miss Kirby. Um, we're now going to move over to uh, our highways officer, Mr. Goddard. Mr. Goddard, are you, uh, you on screen? Yeah, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. As, uh, this, the, as, as Ms. Kirby stated, this planning application has been before you before, or at least uh, a planning application, this site has been before you before. And uh, as she also stated previously, um, it was refused on highway grounds. Now, of course, it, it, it's your prerogative uh, to do so again tonight, should you wish to do so. However, my advice is, is to remain consistent 
and that is that the proposal is acceptable on highway terms. The access is acceptable uh, with regards to width and geometry. It's also acceptable with regards to sight lines. And some of the pictures that Miss Kirby just showed there would show that the sight lines really are, are very good and way above a standard for what is a, a national speed limit uh, here. Um, so it, yes, there was concern that um, because the road is, is quite straight, uh, that vehicle speeds uh, are quite high in this location. However, we continue to take the view that because the sight lines are very good, um, that any drivers and anybody riding the horses would be able to see each other in plenty of time. And therefore we continue uh, to recommend no objection to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Goddard. Um, just bear with me, members, one moment, please. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Goddard. Um, um, we have a uh, novelty for us at Western Area Planning, a real live uh, a, a person to address us. Um, agent for the applicant, Mr. Sam Ekus. Ekus, I do apologize. Um, Sam, if you'd be good enough to take the lectern, please. And make sure you, you mute your, 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 your speak buttons on showing red. And if you bear with me. Oh, you have, have you? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, you, as you know, you've got five minutes to uh, make your presentation. After four minutes, um, I'll give you notice, and uh, should you require it in the 10 seconds to go, I'll say in conclusion. Uh, then I'll ask you to stop. And when you're ready, we'll go. Okay. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for allowing me to speak in support of the proposed development. My name's Sam. I'm a rural planning specialist, and I'm standing in on behalf of the agent, Mr. David Wood. This is the second time these proposals have been put before this committee, and the second time the recommendation has been for approval. It is clear from the original application that there are two key issues, which are the amount of grazing land and highway safety matters. In respect of grazing needs, the British Horse Society recommendation of 0.4 to 0.6 hectares relates to horses, not ponies, and is in situations where they're getting all of their nutritional needs from the grazing land. They also caveat it in saying, and I quote, however, this recommendation can only be a guide as there are many factors affecting this. These factors include the size of the horse, time spent stabled, grass and management, and the time of year, etc. By way of comparison, and to provide you with a real life example, my partner successfully kept three ponies on 0.3 hectares for many years. Management of that site includes a provision of hay nets on a regular basis and rotational grazing. In reality, the grazing needs of ponies and horses is carefully managed to control and help prevent laminitis. In some cases, for those who are not aware, many livery yards restrict or do not offer turnout for this reason. The site extends to some 0.7 hectares of grazing land, which is an increase of approximately 0.3 hectares and just two ponies are to be based on the land. In my professional opinion, and based on actual experience of the grazing needs of ponies, I'm entirely confident that there is enough land to support the proposed development and use. Under good management, there is no reason why the site could not accommodate larger horses. In respect of highways, it is important to note that the council's highways engineer, who is an expert in these matters, has raised no objection to the proposed development. The road is straight with good visibility at the access, enabling motorists and riders to easily see each other. National planning policy sets a very high bar for when an application can be refused on highways grounds. The proposed development must lead to an unacceptable impact on highway safety. The development before you will not.
The Highway Code does not prohibit children or adults from riding on B roads, such as that used to access the site. In fact, the Highway Code puts a legal duty on road users to respect equestrians. In particular, Rules 214 and 215 advise drivers on how to safely navigate past animals and how and to pass wide and slow around horses. In addition, the Highways Code also provides guidance for equestrians with Rule 49 requiring children under the age of 14 to wear a helmet, Rule 50 advising on high visibility clothing, and Rules 52 and 53 providing specific guidance on riding safely on roads. When young riders are out on roads, they will always be accompanied by a responsible adult. If there is a blind bend, the adult will walk ahead and ensure any traffic coming from the opposite direction slows down. Furthermore, both those walking and on horseback will typically wear high visibility clothing as required by the Highways Code so that they are easily visible to drivers. I must stress that horse riding on roads is not an uncommon occurrence in rural areas. The road in question is used by equestrians as shown in this photograph. Whilst the committee may have had concerns previously, such con concerns are not shared by those who write the rules or by the council's highways engineer. As such, the application before you should not attract concerns in respect of highways. Lastly, I want to draw your attention to the visual qualities of the site since an application for a suitable land use has been made. The site has historically been a victim of fly tipping. However, it has now been tidied up cons minute. considerably after being purchased by the applicants. <clears throat> this is a photo before. And after. Mr. Reaches, um, I'll just stop the clock there. We we we, we can't accept these uh, the photographs. It's new new new, new material. So okay, um, we'll I'll I'll, I'll, I'll let your time your, your time stopped. And I'll, uh, <laughs> okay. I'll I'll start it again when Fine. you resume. The ongoing use and management of the land for equestrian purposes will only serve as a long term means of keeping the site visually attractive. In summary, the site provides ample grazing for the number of ponies proposed. It is through my own personal experience that I make this informed statement. Furthermore, there are no reasons to suggest that the proposed development will lead to an unacceptable impact on highway safety. There is no objection from the, highway, from the council's highways engineer and the highways code does not prohibit people from riding horses on roads. Conclusion. The Highways Code provides guidance for both riders and drivers so they can both safely use the roads. As such, there is no good planning reason for a highways objection. Thank you very much. Very well uh, timed. Uh, if you'd like to just remain at the, at the lectern, yep. a very well timed address. Spot on five minutes. Well done for that. I practiced. Uh, <laughs> members, any questions, uh, questions, Mr. Reaches? Councillor Abs. Thank you, Jim. Um, I'll ask the chair and, and the officer, and so the, the attending officer first. Really, uh, we are we're not allowed to ask questions that weren't introduced during the speech. Correct. Okay, I can't ask my question then. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Barnett. Well, Chairman, in view of what's just been said by Councillor Abbs, unfortunately, I shan't be able to ask the question because it was a follow-up from a comment that was made at the site visit but obviously it wasn't in the in the presentation of the applicant tonight so i won't go maybe that. it's a subject for the debate rather than bringing up now how some more um yes uh, you've consistently used the term ponies uh, in describing the use of this of this site um would you be prepared to accept uh, would the would the applicant be prepared to accept a, a condition that related to just ponies um, I don't think it would be necessary. Um, you have some livery yards with horses that, that don't have grazing. So as I was saying previously, you, ma you can manage their grazing needs in such a site. I mean, 0 0.7 hectares is going to be plenty for horses as well as ponies. So I, I don't think it's necessary. Thank you very much. Members, any further questions of Mr. Beaches? No? Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Leachus. You're, you're free to you're free to leave. Members, I should have said at the, the top uh, that there was uh, uh, to be a, a parish council presentation, but um, uh, that particular councillor 
missed the uh, missed the deadline. So uh, sadly, he's uh, he's unable to address us this evening. Um, we've heard uh, from Mr. Eachus on behalf of the agent. Uh, ward member, we're not doing very well this evening. In fact, uh, when it comes to ward members, uh, Councillor James Cole, who called this in, is unable to make the meeting. Also, so uh, it falls to me as as ward member. Uh, just to uh, do the ward member piece. I, I won't even bother starting the clock because uh, I, I won't uh, keep you all for very much time. Uh, I'll just pull up my my piece and it starts now. Members uh, will recall this application in a smaller form earlier this year when it was refused. Reasons for being a bit reasons being for overdevelopment of the site, which appears to have been addressed by proposing a larger area which gives a better horse pony uh, to acre ratio. Uh, BHS recommendation, as we've just heard, uh, being an ideal in old money, uh, one to one and a half acres per animal. Uh, this is based on permanent grazing, which this will not be. The other reason given for refusal, however, still remains, and that is the one of highway safety. Members will recall from the site visit the straight stretch of road adjoining the site on which vehicles reach speeds up to and in excess of the national speed limit that applies. As this is being billed as paddocks and stabling for children's ponies, health and safety remain the parish's primary concern. And that is the end of the lesson. Members, any questions of your ward member, please? Councillor Barnett. Sorry, I didn't get round to put my my green hand up. Um, I don't know whether it's totally relevant, um, uh, Chairman, but uh, the River Embourne has been on occasion um, on certain events during the last two or three decades, risen up to the close to the uh, higher po point, highest point on the bank. Can you re relect? any occasion it's actually lapped over into that particular site at all? I know it has further along, but has it at that particular point, to your knowledge? I, to my knowledge, I'm afraid, my knowledge of that particular uh, part of my ward isn't what it ought to be. Um, the uh, 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 SUDS uh, have, has, has uh, uh, looked at this issue uh, and, and made, their, made their comments, and, and I will defer to that indeed thank you thank you Ms. Mar and, and and the update, updated sheet uh, also um, any further questions members thank you very much um okay i think uh, we're gonna uh, cl clarification whoops, questions of clarification of the officers um Who's going to kick me off here, please? Councillor Arabs. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, yeah, I'm having read, read the documentation, and I, I hope I haven't just missed it, but um, I can't see a, it mentions CS15, but I can't see um, any mention of um, what power will be, which is why I was going to ask the applicant, what, what's actually powering the stable? Is there any lighting? Is it connected to the mains, whatever? So I, I'm, I'm concerned if there is what carbon offsetting, what, what have they done to make this, you know, conform to CS15? I don't see that anywhere. So I'd like clarification from the officers on that. And also biodiversity, I, I haven't heard mentioned at all. And we are talking about <clears throat> taking, admittedly, what was a very rough area and turning it into some paddocks, but we are, you know, concreting over or making hard standing for a fair portion of the land and, and so on and so forth. So I'd like to hear what officers have to say about the NPPF guidelines on biodiversity net gain here, which I can't see at the moment. Mr. Till. Thank you, Chairman. Um, in respect of the uh, issue regarding CS15, um, the, <clears throat> the proposed development um, isn't liable for 3 am um, which is um, one of the requirements of CS15 in terms of non-residential buildings. Um, it's also not um, liable for zero carbon. Um, and therefore, um, in terms of the council's policy and having taken advice from planning policy regarding this matter, um, if the applicant was to propose um, sustainable energy generation measures, then those could be accepted, but we do not have within our policy 
um, the ability to seek delivery of those measures outside of um, the applicant actually proposing those measures themselves. Thank you, Chairman. Um, in respect of... Sorry, Chair, could I just get slightly, before we move on to the second, slightly more clarification on that, because obviously CS15 covers both commercial and residential properties. Is, is this a gap in CS15's ability to control um, development then? Thank you, Chairman. Um, Councillor Abs, as, as you're aware, CS15 was drafted in 2012 and a considerable amount has changed in terms of shifting goalposts as far as um, energy um, efficiency, sustainable energy ge generation um, and national policy is concerned um, since that time. Um, quite simply, um, yes, there is a, um, a deficiency within CS15 in terms of um, what it seeks um, in the modern age. Um, as, as you're aware, we are currently in the process of preparing a new local plan and the MPPF directs us to a plan-led system. Um, so there is a identified problem um, in respect of what CS15 might seek um, as far as renewable energy is concerned. Um, that is an opportunity to be met within the new local plan. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Till. Um, Mr. Sorry, sorry, Chairman, there was the second part of my question. I, I, I realised I interrupted the uh, Simon on that, but there was the second part to do with biodiversity. Mr. Till, would you like to address that? Uh, apologies, uh, Chairman, Councillor Abs. Um, Cheyenne, could you uh, speak to us regarding um, the ecology consultation on this application? Uh, yes, um, con ecology were consulted, um, but they didn't reply on this application. Um, it's not felt that there would be enough to warrant for significant biodiversity net gain. Um, there is a condition um, returning um, external lighting um, just because it's on the edge of the AOMB um, and obviously we'd want to prevent um, light pollution um, for any foraging bats and items and other animals like that. Um, however, due to its, um, the nature of the, current, of the land, how it was, um, just by clearing it, um, of the rubbish um, was considered an improvement to biodiversity, biodiversity net gain. Councillor Abs, does that uh, answer your question? Well, I'll save the rest for debate, I think. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Barnett, is that an old hand? Or? No, it's a new hand, Chairman. Um, it's a question to uh, Mr. Goddard. Um, Mr. Goddard, you mentioned about the national speed limit along that stretch. Obviously, it changes just before the bridge over the A34 down to 30, but the national speed limit along there, to my knowledge, is 60. Am I correct? If, it, if that's correct, is it likely to change in a reduction in the near future? Uh, Chairman, not to my knowledge, um, but the, the, Councillor Barnett is correct. It's the national speed limit of 60 miles per hour front in the site. However, a fairly short distance um, to the to the east, it does change to 30. But we're assuming national speed limit here as, as a worst case. And it has the sight lines for the national speed limit of 215 metres. Thank you, Mr Goddard. Uh, Councillor Culver. Thank you, Chairman. I wonder if officers could comment on whether they've got any concerns about um, waste from the horses and what arrangements there are for disposing of that, because I understand it can be dangerous to water courses because of nitrates and so on. So is it possible to in, um, include a condition about how that horse manure would be dealt with? Thank you, Councillor Culver. I believe that's been addressed, actually, in the update sheet. Mr Till? 
Thank you, Chairman. Um, Councillor Culver, the, um, the, that specific concern is actually addressed within the update sheet um, and very specifically for the um, potential pollution of the watercourse as well um, arising from nitrate. So there is a recommended condition in respect to manure disposal and storage. Thank you, Mr Till. Uh, Councillor Hooker, did I see your physical hand at any stage? There? No, I do apologise. Uh, Councillor Cant. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Paul, just to be absolutely clear about this highways issue, which I, I note in 6.8e, uh, we, we aren't concerned with the issue about whether or not it's safe to ride horses on an open road, are we? We're concerned under that policy with whether the access to and from that side is safe. Is that not right? So debate about whether or not it's safe to ride. Well, we, we could say both. You know, you need to consider whether it's safe to ride horses on the road. I would suggest that it was because um, the, the road is straight and there's very good sight lines. Uh, and vehicles and any riders would be able to see each other in plenty of time, uh, in my view. And also, of course, you're looking at the, the, the sight axis itself. Are the sight lines for any vehicle coming in and out of it um, safe? And I would also say that they are. So irrespective of whether or not you're safe when you're on the road itself, you believe the access to and from that has sufficient sight lines and yes. openness for vehicles. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr Goddard. Uh, Councillor Moore. Uh, thank you, Jim. Just returning to my uh, piece about um, horses versus ponies, could the officers confirm whether, whether it is possible uh, to make a condition on two ponies as opposed to two horses? Mr Till? Thank you, Chairman. Um, Chairman, I think that um, specifying the difference between ponies and horses is um, verging onto matters that aren't really the proper remit of planning. Um, the, the keeping of um, two different varieties of the same animal um, on a piece of land um, really is, um, in my view, somewhat splitting hairs, Chairman. So I think in terms of the test set out in the National Planning Policy Framework, and particularly in terms of conditions being reasonable and related to planning, um, the uh, condition along those lines would fail to meet the tests. Thank you, Mr Till. Members, are we all done? We're done with our offices. I'm going to open this up now for debate. Um, do I have do I have someone to start me off? An opening bid, please. Thank you, Councillor Apps. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'll let you all shoot me down in flames in a bit then. Um, so 5.1 says uh, of this document we are understanding this evening, the following policies of the statutory development plan are relevant to the consideration of this application. And it states a bunch of them, but includes CS15. So I do take that into account um, because it tells me to right here. Um, and then now I look at CS15, it basically goes on to say non-residential developments from 2013 all will achieve Bream Excellent um, and then goes on non-residential developments from 2019 will be zero carbon. But yet we're still building things, admittedly this is stables and so on and so on, we're still building things that aren't getting even close. So uh, either CS15 is applicable and I've been at inquiries where our own officers have, have argued that CS15 is applicable uh, and, and, and not not uh, just because the sustained for codable, code for sustainable homes has lapsed by the government, it does go on to the other preamble to say equivalent methods and so on and so forth. So I, I can't get over the fact that when I read this documentation, as much as I uh, have huge respect for the officers and what, he, what Simon just said, I can't get over the fact that it says in writing that to me. So I, that's a sticking point for me. And um, unfortunately, the other officer said, well, we've tidied the land up and that's for it. Therefore, our biodiversity net gain. I, I'm, unfortunately, that's not a gain for me because undisturbed land with almost part of anything on it, as long as it's not toxic, will uh, encourage all sorts of additional biodiversity. So I'm struggling on how that biodiversity gain is there. We could then go on to talk about the roads and the other stuff off as well, but I'm, I'm locked into these two issues at the moment myself. And I think, okay, I can see, I can see Mr. Till bristling here and I'm gonna 
cut the uh, the debate short for the time being and and pass over to Mr. Till. Chairman, I, I apologise for intervening in the debate, but there's a point of clarification that didn't arise quite from Councillor Abbs's question earlier on. Um, but I should mention because it is directly relevant to what he's um, just discussed. Um, this is um, from um, guidance that uh, I was provided by the um, Planning Policy Officer um, earlier on today. Um, BRIAM only applies to buildings in which people normally spend their time. So I think the issue is resolved by the fact that um, the BRIAM criteria are not actually referring to this form of building, Councillor Lance. Thank you very much for that update. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Till. Thank you, Councillor Abs. Uh, Councillor Kant. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I must admit, with some of these call-ins, I sometimes get the feeling we're doing molehills uh, into mountains. Uh, you know, it appears to me by reading this and driving past that this is a small rural business attempting to enhance what's probably a struggle to make a living uh, by improving a piece of land and introducing a fairly relatively minor change to its business model in order to presume to make it more viable. Um, <laughs> I haven't yet heard anything which persuades me personally that uh, any of that isn't a perfectly valid reason to grant this application. Uh, and I would propose that we move to approve the application in accordance with the uh, officer's recommendations. Thank you, Councillor Kant. Um, I'm going to pass over to Councillor Cole. Thank you, Chairman. Um, my previous concerns at this application have been addressed because I was concerned about animal welfare uh, and the size of the site, but the size of the uh, size of the site has been almost doubled. Uh, so that issue goes away. Um, Mr. Till's already explained about Briam, which I was going to mention anyway. Uh, we're talking stabling here um, and not people. So I think that is a, uh, an argument that we, we wouldn't stand. Uh, and I think it's an unreasonable condition to say that only ponies could be on that site um, because uh, <laughs> We've heard from the uh, expert that horses could be accommodated on that site. And Mr Goddard, whose views on um, highways I respect totally, has said that he is that there are good sight lines and there, the, there is no real highway safety issue uh, there. Uh, and it will be difficult to object on highways issues because vehicles can be seen. Um, and living in a rural area like we do, we have horses going up and down uh, narrow lanes all the time. Uh, and my view is that uh, motorists have to be uh, cognizant of horses, just as horse riders do. Um, it's a rural location. I, I'm struggling to see how we could do no other than approve officer recommendation. And I would be happy to second councillor Count's uh, proposal. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Cole. Councillor Barnett. Uh, Chairman, members, without reiterating too many of the points uh, which Councillor Cole has raised, um, I was in a very similar position. I was concerned a little bit about the uh, uh, animal welfare um, last time. I was also concerned, obviously, about the overall site, and I was a little bit concerned about the access. But I think most of those issues have been addressed. And therefore, I should be supporting the uh, proposal that's been put forward tonight. Thank you, Councillor Barnett. Councillor Hooker. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, I sat on this uh, previous application and went to the previous site meeting. And um, having gone to the site meeting last week, there is a, a vast improvement in, in the uh, quality of the uh, of the grass in the original paddock. Um, and has already been said it's uh, it's double the size and and uh, quite capable now of taking two two ponies certainly um as i say the other thing with highways um our highways officer is uh, is quite happy with that my only observation was that having now extended that field um, and the concerns of the highway i do understand that there was a gate at the bottom of that field which would have negated uh the danger of horses taking certainly the length of that field to go down to the bridle path, which is to the, is it the west, I guess, uh, of there. But I understand highways did ask them to 
I'm not sure, uh, actually closed that gate off. I believe um, that was the case, yeah. Which I think is a shame, but uh, I know it's very close to that uh, that bend. Uh, maybe the site lines are, aren't adequate, but uh, looking at the two options there uh, of to take away a good 200 yards or so of, of riding a horse on the road for a gate at the bottom of that field, it's not on the plan, and absolutely it's not for us to consider, but it's just an observation on, on the site visit. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Hooker. Members, anything further to add? Okay, we have uh, proposer, Councillor Kant, proposed uh, acceptance uh, of this, uh, seconded by Councillor Cole. I'll take a show of hands, please. That's all bar Councillor Abs. Thank you very much. Um, I shall abstain. Councillor Abs. I shall also abstain, Chairman. Thank you, members. Uh, that proposal has been agreed. Uh, moving on to item number two. This is 21 stroke 01038 stroke house, number one, Croft Road, Newbury. Uh, Mr. Massey Pasiwa, uh, the senior planning officer, would you like to begin your presentation, please? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, good evening, everyone. I'll just share my screen. Ooh. Can you see my, my presentation? Mm -hmm. Uh, that's that. That's good, uh, Massey. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we've got an um, update sheet provided, um, which uh, clarifies a, a couple of points raised at the uh, committee site visit. Um, the the first point um, is that. Um, um, during the site visit, the applicants agent. Um, indicated that um, the proposed new fencing would be entirely placed on the applicant's side of the land. Uh, however, it was also stated that um, uh, the proposed new fence would be no higher than the existing um, as viewed uh, from the um, neighboring property. This was um, said in error. Um, and um, we've uh, had clarification that indeed uh, it will be higher than the existing fence, um, as indicated on the proposed fence details plan, which is provided in the committee report pack, as well as um, at paragraph 6.9 uh, of your committee report, where the height of the fence is um, discussed um, and the, um, how, it, um, how far it extends above the existing fence. Um, also, during the previous committee uh, on the 21st of July, when the application was deferred, there were questions raised on the measurements uh, on the proposed development. Um, officers have requested that the applicant includes measurements on key drawings, and these are provided uh, on your um, uh, um, uh, committee um, agenda uh, plans pack. Um, the application, Mr. Chairman, seeks planning permission um, for the construction of two-story extension to the side of the existing dwelling, a single-story extension to the rear, um, as well as um, uh, um, uh, um, addition um, of uh, a new fence to the garden as, as described, which uh, is the boundary shared with number three Croft Road. Uh, the proposed fence plan is included in the agenda pack. Um, the reason for uh, uh, consideration by the committee is the application has been called in by the ward member. 
um, uh, to uh, so the committee can consider the massing of the extension. Uh, a summary of representations given at section four of the report uh, and the officer recommendation is for approval subject to conditions. The application property is a semi-detached dwelling, um, two-story uh, with vehicle parking to the front and a private garden to the rear. The, the lie of the land is such that the land slopes um, upwards towards the south um, and the neighboring properties to the west lie at a lower ground level. And these are the properties along uh, Wenden Road. Three parking spaces would still be available on the hard standing to the front of the dwelling as shown on the proposed block plan. Um, and this in, the proposal itself involves no increase in the number of bedrooms. Um, so the parking is considered sufficient. With regards to neighboring properties, concerns have been raised that the development would cause unnecessary shading and loss of daylight and sunlight um, to neighboring properties. Um, the re relevant planning points raised through the uh, representations as indicated are shown in the report. It is acknowledged that the scheme would be constructed close to the common boundary shared with number three uh, Croft Road. However, a daylight and sunlight report has been prepared uh, by Right of Light Consulting, uh, and this report accompanies the submission. The conclusions of the study are that numerical results indicate that there will be no impact um, in terms of loss of sunlight and daylight or neighboring amenity. Um, Mr. Chairman, your officers have no reason to dispute the assessment which was carried out independently um, and um, given the um, professional uh, requirements for uh, the surveyors involved. Um, the council's tree officer has no objection. They've reviewed the proposal. There is a beech tree which um, uh, is within a neighboring garden, but that won't be affected. There are no objections from the highways team um, the next slides, Mr. Chairman, will just show the uh, existing and proposed plans. Um, this shows the extent of the extension to the rear um, as opposed to the existing. The next slide shows the first floor um, existing and proposed plans. Um, as you can see, these are the um, single story rear extensions. Uh, the next slide shows the front elevation um, indicating the set down um, side extension um, and the existing. The next slide shows uh, the west elevation. Um, this is the view um, from um, number 31, 37, I beg your pardon, uh, and 39 Wenden Roads um, towards the site. Um, as uh, members can see, the uh, proposed plans now have measurements, uh, which, in the, which are included in your, in your pack. Um, and it includes uh, an indication of the line of the existing fence um, that um, provides the boundary between the site and the properties um, to the west. Um, this uh, uh, slide shows the um, rear elevation, again, uh, the dimensions are included. It shows the uh, proposed um, mono pitch roof uh, and the flat roof, which is uh, nearest to uh, number three, Croft Road, which is, is over here. Um, this shows the east elevation as a section. Again, it's showing the Mono pitch roof, which has some glazing above. Um, there is no uh, second floor. Uh, this is just to create lighting and a bit more open space within the extension. The next slide is um, just photographs, Mr. Chairman. I'll go through these quickly. They are within your pack. This is the front elevation of the um, semi detached properties. This is number three, Croft Road. Um, as you can see, number three Croft Road has been extended to the side. 
as well, um, which is this extension here, and the proposal will um, infill this space. Um, again, uh, a view of the front of the property and the existing parking. Um, this uh, image shows uh, number 37 and 39 Winden Road, which are set at uh, lower ground level. Um, a view of, our, of the application property from the rear of the garden um, and the existing fence, uh, which will be um, uh, retained, but a, a new fence will be constructed um, along, um, along the boundary as indicated in the plans. Um, this is the existing single story extension to the rear, which will be removed um, and um, the, uh, where the, um, the new proposal will be uh, located. Um, again, this is uh, uh, um, showing the number three Croft Road, which is um, one half of the pair of uh, semi-detached properties. Again, we can see um, uh, uh, the um, existing uh, two-story side extension to number three Croft Road. Um, this fence um, along the boundary will be replaced, um, but um, the height of this fence will be as existing. And this is shown again on the plans. Uh, again, that's the a view towards number three Croft Road. Um, this is the tree we were referring to uh, and the boundary to Wendon Road. Uh, and again, um, the boundary towards uh, Wendon Road um, and, and the shed which will be removed um, or the garage which will be removed from, from the, um, uh, as, as part of the proposal. Uh, that concludes the presentation, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Masiwa. Um, moving on to highways, Mr. Goddard, do you have any comment you'd like to make? Uh, can do, Chairman. Uh, your, your highway officers were keen to ensure that three car parking spaces were retained within the site um, because that is what is required uh, with the Council's parking standards and from the plan submitted uh, and a, a, a visit made to the site, we are satisfied that three car parking spaces can be accommodated uh, within the front of the property and uh, it's therefore acceptable to highways. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Goddard. Um, now we move on to our speakers uh, on the application. Um, and from the, uh, we have Councillor Nigel Foote. I'm sorry, I apologize. I think that's, um, that's referring to Thank you very much, uh, uh, Councillor Foot. Um, you've seen how this goes. Um, you, you have up to five minutes to make your presentation. Uh, after four minutes, I'll give you notice, should you require it. Uh, and with te 10 seconds to go, I'll say in conclusion, and then I'll ask you to stop. When you're good and ready, I'll start the clock. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman. Um, welcome, uh, members. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Nigel Foote. I'm the current chair of Newbury Town Council Planning and Highways. Um, this application came before Newbury Town Council Planning and Highways Committee on the 1st of June this year. And our conclusion was that we made no comment due to the conflicting evidence from the applicant and the neighbours. However, we felt that the application needs to be decided by planning officers, but we wanted to acknowledge the real concerns of neighbours uh, should be acknowledged in this application. I attended the site visit on the 7th of October, again as a representative of Newbury Town Council. My concerns were with the neighbours, especially numbers 37 and 39 Wendon Road and Threecroft Road. The problem with this site is the um, topography, the fact that uh, the houses at 37 and 39 Wendon Road are some considerable distance below uh, the level of the garden um, at number one Croft Road. Um, and it was helpful because the architect had a scaled uh, model, which was quite useful to look at during that site visit to get an idea of the mono-pitched roof. 
Now, the appraisal uh, in the pack that you have, the summary, um, says that the planning officers uh, at West Barks um, feel that uh, they have no objection to this application proceeding. And I would like to finish by just summarising, if I may, the position of the Newbury Town Council. We did say that we felt that this application should be decided by the planning officers, and we note that they do not object to the application subject to the conditions that they've stated. However, my personal view is that following that site visit, I would like members to pay very close attention to the height of the mono-pitched roof in this application, and in in my view, it is too high, and that if at all possible, the height of this should be reduced. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Foote. That's well, well within your time. Members, do we have any questions of Councillor Foot, please? Councillor Abbs. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, yeah, you mentioned there the, the, the height and you have concern. Is, is that related to, in any way, to the light survey? And because uh, I'm or is it just a personal one? It looks very high. Or thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, it's not as you know. Uh, the light uh, survey that was carried out had no objection um, to the height of the mono pitched roof. No, it was purely my my perception on that site visit. When you are standing at the back of particularly number thirty nine Wendon Road, and you look up the garden towards where this extension is going to be. The monopitched roof comes up almost to the height of the gutters uh, on the house at One Croft Road. And to me, that that looked too high. If it could be reduced, uh, I, I don't think many people would have much of an objection. Thank you. That's right. um, of course, we are looking at the application as it is before us this evening. And that's what we'll yeah. be considered. But your point is noted, uh, Councillor Foote. Council Cole. Um, thank you, Chairman. It's not really a question for uh, uh, Mr Foote, but um, he has expressed his personal views on this when he's supposed to be representing the Town Council's views. Uh, and I feel that there is a conflict here and that we should be really uh, looking at the Town Council's views that are before us in the agenda and not the personal views of, uh, of Mr Foote, however relevant they may be. I think there has been a clouding here uh, because he's expressed a personal opinion. That is just my, my comment, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cole. Councillor Abbs? Yeah, just to come back on that, I, I thought the councillor had made it quite clear that he was there representing the town council at the meetings to specifically to look at the problem. So I, I heard it slightly different than Councillor Colin that he was expressing his authority or the authority he was given to assess what was going on on the site. So thank you. That's noted. Um, councillors, any further questions? Mr. Foote, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Uh, we now move on to uh, objectors, uh, and uh, for this we go across to Zoom. Uh, Ms. Booth, can I ask you to invite uh, uh, Colin Giller, please, uh, uh, into the meeting? Mr. Giller, can I ask that you uh, reveal yourself with your video, please? Good evening, Mr. Giller. Can you hear us okay? You might like to unmute yourself. Uh, unmute yourself. There we go. Can you hear me now? I can indeed. Um, so um, before we start, um, you've heard how this is going to go. You have five minutes to uh, 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 say your piece. Um, I'll give you fair warning at four, and then... Ch 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 Chairman, uh, there's, there's actually another objector who's going to speak first, Mr Coleman. Right, OK. Um, thank you very much for, for pointing that out. Um, do we know how we're going to divide the time, please, between the two of you? Uh, Mr. Coleman will be taking 90 seconds and I'll have three and a half minutes. It's a well rehearsed uh, address by the sound of things. Uh, in that case, Mr. Goldman, good evening to you. If you'd be good enough to unmute yourself. Good evening. Uh, and um, I, I hope you've heard how 
this is going to go uh, time-wise. And uh, I gather you've got the first 90 seconds all to yourself. So when you're ready, I'll start the clock. Okay, thank you. Uh, good evening, and thank you to the committee members who made a, a site visit last week. I have no objection to our neighbours at One Croft Road extending their home to meet either the present or future needs of their family. However, I do object to aspects of the design submitted for approval, as in my opinion, they do not follow the guidance of the SPG, and so will adversely affect the lives of those in neighbouring properties. Some of those that relate to us at number 39 Wendon Road are, firstly, the rear extension being over seven metres long, I consider is not subservient to the main house, and will also unnecessarily endanger a mature, mature tree that is on our property. Secondly, the monopitch roof already mentioned uh, is effectively a first floor extension, with the ridge being a height of 4.8 metres, which from our ground floor living room will have an effective height of over six metres and will extend uh, for the length of the building. It also extends upwards from the fence and despite its sloping nature will be overbearing, an overbearing feature. The proposed west facing windows, lastly, are far less than the recommended 21 metres distance from our rear facing windows. As the eaves are shown as 2.2 metres high, we remain uncertain if these windows will be above uh, the current fence line over which we have no control. It seems to me to alter any of these items to meet the SPG would not greatly hinder the provision of improved access on the ground floor that the applicant is seeking. Thank you. Let's take that over to you. Thank you and good evening. Uh, I'm Colin Giller, a fellow of the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors. I work for Bennington Green in Thatcham and have been practicing in this area for over 25 years. The owners of Three Croft Road are the closest neighbours and will be most affected by this application and on their behalf, I call upon the committee to refuse this application. This is a large extension. It extends over 7.2 metres. That's over 23 feet from the rear wall of the house. It is described as single storey, but the design includes a five metre length of continuous glazing at first floor level, set in a vertical wall facing my client's property. This, is part of, this part of the extension rises to 4.8 metres in line with the top of the first floor windows. The flat roof section is 2.8 metre high and is just over a metre from the boundary fence with number three. It includes windows which are eight inches higher than the fence. In the space between the extension and the boundary, there is to be a new window in the rear wall of the house, the top of which is higher than the fence by 400 millimetres, that's 16 inches. The glazing will reduce privacy, the taller windows will allow overlook and all will add to light pollution. My client's residential amenity will be significantly affected. I asked members to cast their minds back to the site visit last week and standing in the back garden of number three. This provided an excellent position to visualize the bulk of the meeting of the building, the projection, the height of the top of the sloping roof and the dominance of the line of glazing. The most relevant policy here is SPG house extensions. All other extensions in this area have been judged in relation to this policy, so should this. National policy requires local design guidance to be considered, yet the SPG seems to have been virtually ignored. A major concern there is the effect on neighbours and the loss of daylight and sunlight. It says that single storey extensions should not project beyond a line drawn at 60 degrees from the middle of the neighbour's nearest ground floor window. This proposal is 70 degrees. The scheme has vertical glazing at first floor level. Therefore, it should be considered as two storey. For two storey extensions, the SBG has a limit of 45 degrees. This proposal is 48 degrees. So in both ground and first floor condition, it fails the requirements of the SBG. As mentioned, the applicant instead relies on a specialist report, which concludes there is no significant loss of sunlight and daylight. So That's one three. minute, Mr. Giller. However, even within the report, it confirms that there will be reductions of 18% of total sunlight and 20% of available winter sunlight. A 20% loss of sunlight in the winter is a significant figure and will make my client's principal living room a lot darker. The application includes for boundary fences to rise to 2.5 metres high. That is 20 inches higher than the current fencing. That is substantial and will affect the residential amenity of my clients. I do not have time to consider other aspects of design and the dominating nature of the extensions. 
And I'm also concerned that the application includes dimensions which appear to be incorrect and which should be clarified further. And in conclusion? For these reasons, I ask my, uh, my clients, ask the members to refuse this application. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Geller. Uh, members, questions? Please. I'm looking around the room, Councillor Abs. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Mr. Giller. Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, you you spent quite a bit of time talking about the height of the the extension. Do do I take it therefore that, in your opinion, the the would you would you be uh, saying things a lot differently if it, it was a um, flat roof instead of this pitch roof? Is do I could I conclude that from what you've said? My worry on behalf of my clients is the flat roof reaches to the top of the first floor windows. Um, I, I, I think uh, that the... Sorry, the, sorry yeah, Mr. Gilly, do you mean the bottom of the first floor windows or do you really mean the top? The, the flat the, roof. I beg your pardon. The, the pitched roof reaches to the top of the first floor windows. Yes, yeah, so I was asking about your opinion if this was a flat roof, not a pitched roof. It, it, the main concern... You, you've spent quite a bit of time talking about the height of, and you're really referring to the height of the pitch roof, although you've mentioned the flat roof section a lot. I'm trying to ascertain what, what your opinion is if the pitch roof was not there, if it was the whole thing was a flat roof, would that have made any difference? That would certainly help, but the uh, projection of the building and the proximity to the boundary uh, and the height of the windows which are overlooking uh, on the east elevation of the single story section would still be close to my client's property and uh, be dominating. Thank you, Mr. Geller. Members, any further questions? I think, I think we're done, gentlemen. Thank you very much indeed for your presentation and for fielding the questions. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Booth, if I can ask you to uh, escort the gentleman back to the waiting room, please. And then we come on to the agents, which I believe are here in the room this evening, uh, Jonathan Jarman and Karen Redford. Thank you both for coming. Um, I'm sure you've uh, gathered how we, how we approach this. Five minutes between the two of you. And when you're ready, I shall reset and start the clock. Okay. Right. Uh, so good evening, Mr. Chairman, councillors. Uh, so my name is Jonathan Jarman, and I'm here in support of the application. I've been asked by uh, Mr. and Mrs. Redford um, in my capacity as a Charter Town Planner. Uh, before I say any more, I'm going to hand over to Mrs. Redford. I'm Karen Redford, resident of One Croft Road. I've had rheumatoid arthritis for 25 years, which has resulted in mobility problems, including four joint replacements and periods of wheelchair use. When we moved into our house six years ago, I was reasonably stable. However, we had one eye on the future and saw that many houses in the road already had extensions, including our immediate neighbours, thought that if we needed extra space, it would probably be relatively simple, as there was always a, already a precedent for a two-storey side and a one-storey rear extension next door. Unfortunately, the future's come to meet me sooner than I'd hoped, and now I also have rheumatoid-related heart failure, we need to re reorganise the house even more now, especially downstairs bathroom, access to um, uh, an accessible bathroom. Um, I've been having to make humiliating decisions every day for a long time, whether to try and make it up and down the stairs to use the bathroom or pee in a jug, whether to have a shower today and have to ask my nine-year-old or my husband to help or whether to stay dirty. We're not asking for anything extraordinary, not anything that hasn't already been done extra space to accommodate my needs now and improve my quality of life and future-proof the house against further deterioration, which will inevitably come. So as you've just heard from Mrs Redford, the proposed extension is a necessary improvement to her home. It's not been done on a whim, but the purpose of securing her health, her safety and her comfort. In, in respect to the specifics of the proposal, this is of course the second time it's been brought in front of the committee. However, we know from discussions uh, at the July meeting, no objection was stated in respect to the principle of development, and indeed officers are recommending approval. That position has not changed, we welcome it. 
The concerns have been raised in respect of design and amenity impacts from loss of light and overlooking, and these are matters we wish to reassure on. To be clear, the proposal essentially includes two elements. The proposed two-storey side extension is similar in appearance to that approved and constructed on the adjoining house. It is entirely in keeping with the local form and benefits the pair of semi-detached houses. But the rear extension is less conventional, primarily due to its proposed roof form, but that is not the same as harm, and the designer, if anything, should be applauded for their not designing something which is run of the mill. By definition, it will, it will extend out from the existing dwelling, but in this, in this case, seven metres from the rear wall of the host dwelling, although only six metres from the back of the existing kitchen, and only 1.7 metres beyond the line of the neighbour's extension. Even so, regard should be given to the fact that it is stepped in from the side, from the shared boundaries, and its closest point with number three will measure 2.8 metres in height. Whilst on paper that still means it's partly visible, partly visible above the fence line, in reality this would be reasonably limited and not to the extent that it would be harmful. Concern has been raised in regard to overlooking and light spill from windows in the side element of the roof facing towards number three. However, these are high level, above head height and separation is such they could not reasonably result in an impact. There are then windows on the side elevation facing towards number 39, Wendon Road, but these are again stepped in from the boundary. Um, the height of the windows will be 1.7 metres, so appear below the fence line. Uh, there is also separation of the garden of number 39, which is approximately 10 metres in depth. Again, no real uh, reason for concern. In respect of the provision of natural light, this is an area of, of uh, technology. And therefore, professional report has been undertaken and submitted as part of the application. Uh, this demonstrates the proposed development is sufficiently safeguards uh, the daylight and sunlight immunity of neighbouring properties. To conclude, um, the proposal would have an acceptable impact on the character of the area and would not have a significant adverse impact upon residential amenity of the neighbouring properties. Accordingly, the recommendation is to grant permission we urge you to accept that recommendation. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Members, questions, please. Councillor Wollaston. Thank you, Chairman. Um, clearly, I think everyone will be sympathetic to uh, Mrs Jarman's health issues. And Mrs Redford. I'm sorry, Mrs yeah. Redford, I do apologise. Um, for my point of view, I, I struggle to understand why you went with this application with the monocline roof. I don't think, personally, I don't think see any problem with the extension to the right. It duplicates what's on the, on the left. And nor do I see really any objection to an, to an extension, uh, which is, as has been said, is, is similar to many other houses in the area. But the extreme height of the, uh, the monocline roof concerns me. I just wonder why the designers went that, down that route. Are you asking me? I don't mind. <laughs> Do you, want to Do you want to give a first? I'll, I'll give my point of view of that. Um, I, we asked our designer to design something that was beautiful looking, and it is, but also the extension needs to get some light in it. Obviously, it's reasonably close to the boundary, when although we have windows, there is going to be a fence there, and actually getting light in, I think, will be difficult without the monopitch roof. I think that sums it up well. Thank you very much. Councillor Abs. Thank, thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, I'm hoping you can help me with this. Uh, the, the light report, uh, I'm struggling to find the dimensions that we used on which the light report was based because we've had several meetings and several people saying, well, that's one wrong, that's wrong. What numbers were used in the light report? And either, are they now the same numbers as in the actual marked up application as we're looking at it? Yes, so, so my understanding is that they've been based on the... Sorry, is it your understanding or is it? So, so they, they've been based on the um, on the drawings which are in front of you tonight. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Councillor Abs. Members, any further questions? I'm looking at my screen around the room. No, thank you very much indeed for your presentation. Thank you very much.
Uh, we now move on to the ward members. Um, and remiss of me, I should have asked uh, Councillor Abs and uh, Councillor Marsh whether you're speaking. My understanding is Councillor Marsh wishes to, to speak, and I, I don't wish to uh, impinge on his time. Okay. Okay. Councillor Marsh. Thank you very much, Councillor Abs. Councillor Marsh, over to you. Um, you've heard how it goes. You're more than, uh, more than aware. And I'll start the clock when you start. Thank you very much, Mr Chairman. Um, as a ward member, I'd like to say a few words in support of this application. I've attended the site visits to neighbouring properties, as well as number one Croft Road. I'm aware of the concerns raised by some neighbours, but having taken everything into account, I believe that the um, applicant and the architect have gone to some length to meet the objections, have come up with a proposal that's attractive in terms of the design, but more importantly, practical in terms of meeting the needs of the Redford family. It is quite a large extension, nobody disputes that, but they're not just doing it for the sake of it, also they can sell it for more money um, a few years down the line, but to meet real long-term needs. I'll say more about that in a minute. Um, the, as we've heard, the front of the house will present a, a real improvement uh, to the aspect uh, along Croft Road in that it will match the extension at number three, um, while still leaving them the amount of parking that is required. And I think that's better than the current lopsided arrangement, as we've seen in many other um, developments. As for the rear extension, I think this is largely a subjective matter. The objectors don't like the design, and I respect that. I do like it. And if I had to choose between looking out on the current derelict garage, which is an eyesore, and this extension, um, I'd go for the extension. Um, in terms of its impact on neighbouring properties, I don't think they, that it overlooks them. In fact, the windows that currently do overlook the houses in Wendon Road in the side of the house at the moment won't be there. Um, it's not, in my view, intrusive. Um, and um, everyone's mentioned this, the, the, the sunlight and daylight survey, but it does say it will have a low impact on the light receivable by number three Croft Road and numbers 37 and 39 Wendon Road. Um, as I mentioned, as we've heard from... Uh, the uh, Mrs Redford herself, most of the features of this development have been designed with a view to meeting the needs of Mrs Redford and the family, which include wheelchair access to the bathroom, bedroom, kitchen, level access to the rear patio, and as also an upgraded um, ceiling structure on the first floor to enable a hoist to be installed. I think West Berkshire Council should be proud to support such an imaginative design which I believe will transform the lives of this family <clears throat> without, as the officers put it in their report, having a significant adverse impact on the residential amenity of neighbouring properties. Now, I'm not going to get involved in the technical arguments about this or that measurement, which we heard at the site meeting, because I think the officers have dealt with this and made their recommendation, which is to grant permission, um, subject to the, the very reasonable conditions that they set out in the report. So I do hope that members will accept that recommendation and uh, grant their approval for this application. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Marsh. Members questioned, uh, Councillor Wilson, was that a hand? I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, I'm taking no. that. Any questions of Councillor Marsh members? No, I think you're, uh, you're off scot-free. Thank you very much for that. And, Thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman. So I um, remove myself from... I think you're about to be uh, uh, walked virtually into the waiting room. OK, thank you. OK, members, we move on now to uh, questions of clarification from our presenting planning officer, Mr Masiwa. Councillor Kant. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, Mr. Masiwa, really, uh, the, it appears to me that uh, the footprint of this building isn't out of kilter with the other properties, and that this uh, there seems to be a degree of consensus, I agree with Councillor Wollaston, the, the degree of consensus that in principle the extension itself is fine. I, I, guess, I guess the roof, which does appear to be quite unusual, is in design in, in, in the context of, of properties around Newbury is a matter of taste, I guess, whether that's something you would choose or not to. But I suppose what I, what I get down to with this is to ask uh, Mr. Basile whether in the context of this elevated rear roof, there is any real planning reason to decline 
uh, uh, to approve it? And is that, you know, if, if we were to decline, is there a real reason to decline that sort of roof on top of that extension? So it's a question of the roof design you'd like yes i mean it's, it's a, realistically on. we may or may not like it variously around the room but you know in re, in reality is there any real planning reason to decline that design of of roof uh, setting aside all the other issues mr masiwa over to you uh, thank you uh councillor kant uh, um yes as indicated in the report um the the, the design of the single story re-extension is it is contemporary. Um, it, 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 it's, it's a step away from the traditional uh, design of uh, the main uh, house. Uh, but this is not unusual uh, in terms of design to have contemporary uh, extensions to traditional um, dwellings. Um, and uh, as explained in the committee report, uh, whilst the uh, mono pitch roof is, it is unusual, um, uh, I think as the applicant has explained, uh, officers do accept that it is functional um, in terms of allowing the, the light um, into the space. Um, and, um, and I think um, what one consideration we also took was um, rather have the um, mono pitch roof um, uh, as indicated um, than an expansive flat roof rear extension, uh, which would cover the existing flat roof that, that's proposed, um, as well as the, the mono pitch floor space. Um, I think in terms of the rear properties um, adjacent um, uh, Wyndon Road, um, we've also considered that the, the roof slope, um, the maximum height is 4.2 meters um, from the ground floor uh, within the site. Uh, and the roof actually slopes away from the boundary shared with the properties um, to the west on Wendon Road. Um, so in that respect, um, we, we do not consider that there is a significant adverse impact that, that would warrant a, a refusal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Masiwa. On, on those grounds, personally, I'd like to propose that we accept the recommendations of the officers. OK, well, we'll, we'll wait till we come to the uh, debate itself, Councillor Pant. Uh, so hold that one uh, in the back pocket. Councillor Culver. Thank you, Chairman. Um, at the site visit, the issue was raised about the proximity of the extension to the fence and whether or not there would be a problem with footings for that extension. I don't think that's been raised by anyone yet this evening. I wondered if officers might be able to comment on whether they're satisfied that there would be no impact on the neighbours' fencing during the building. Thank you, Chairman. Um, the location of footings is not a material planning consideration. It's a matter that falls under the Party Wall Act and the building regulations. So we would be venturing into territory that is outside of our remit if we were to go into detail regarding that. Councillor Culver, thank you. Thank you, Mr Till. Councillor Moore. Um, yes, I'd just like to ask uh, Mr. Masiwa, the, the fence to the west of the property, in other words, between uh, One Croft Road and the Wendon Road properties, uh, is that part of the planning application and is that, uh, is that fence height um, defined and part of the conditions? Thank you, Councillor Moore. Um, no, the, the fence um, to the west is not part of the proposal. Um, it is indicated on, on the elevation, uh, the Western elevation, um, just for illustration, really. Um, but um, the, the fence to the boundary to, to the east with number three Croft Road, there is proposal to partly um, replace the existing fence along the boundary. Uh, and then up, the applicant also proposes a, a new fence, which is uh, on their side of the, um, the, the boundary uh, on that side. I hope that answers that one. Uh, could I just come back on the, 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 the original part of my question, which was the, the boundary between Wendon Road properties? So in terms of overlooking those properties, there are no windows uh, uh, proposed that do that if that fence is in place. Um, so is that, could that be part of the, 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 the main, maintenance of that fence to avoid overlooking those Wendon Road properties? Could that be part of the, the conditioning? Um, 
Thank you, Councillor. I, I have I misunderstood the design. I, I thought there were windows in that west facing um, lounge. Um, you, you are correct. Um, the, the fence is existing on that western boundary um, and the proposed windows on that side are um, below the fence line. Um, and um, um, I think as, as the fence is there, we've considered that the windows will not um, actually overlook the, the, the neighbouring property as long as there is a boundary there. Um, there's no reason to believe that the boundary will be removed. Um, and um, 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 yeah, we haven't, you know, um, uh, um, sort of um, considered that as as, a, uh, as an issue really. Um, but uh, as you can see on the proposed western elevations in your pack, there is an illustration of the line of um, of the timber fence on that boundary, um, and it's above the, um, the the proposed windows. So in terms of in terms of overlooking to uh, Wendon Road properties. We consider there won't be any 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 overlooking. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Masira. Mr. Till. Um, Councillor Moore, it's just to add that the owner of the properties on Wendland Road would have every right to maintain their boundary with a two-metre fence. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Till. Any any further questions, members? Okay, now we're going to open this up to debate, and I've. Uh, Councillor Moore, is that you jumping straight in or no? Councillor Abs, I'm going to go to you first, please. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman. Um, I don't think anybody on the committee would uh, have anything but uh, sympathy for Mrs. Redford's position and as someone who's been recently diagnosed with arthritis, yeah, I'm, I'm heading down the same path myself. So I totally understand where she's coming from, especially if she's in the advanced stages of that. However, having said that, um, there are also neighbours that have equal concerns who haven't been here but have expressed it. As I, as I said earlier on, we some of us were, were lobbied beforehand. So um, that emotional bit is balanced somewhat by what might happen to other neighbours. So I'm, I'm trying to look at this as cold as I can in terms of what could be achieved for Mrs Redford but without impacting others. And I'm, I'm, I'm still left. Um, one of the comments that was made about was introducing light and um, that's why it's so tall, so light could be brought in. Well, you know, a sky lantern would do actually even more than, than a, and a sloping roof. So there are plenty of ways to design in light in, in a flat roof time scenario. So this isn't, from a, getting more light in, it isn't an optimum solution, but it does introduce a series of challenges for neighbours, more than I'm probably comfortable with overall and on balance. So um, we can talk about massing and things of that nature, and we are allowed to look at pro styling. Oh, is this in keeping with the area? It's one of the criteria we're allowed to look at. It isn't in keeping. It's been very clearly stated that it isn't in keeping. And, and um, there are plenty of extensions around that are of a flat roof nature and so on and so forth. So, so I, I leave that. I'm not going to make a proposal at this point, but I, I leave that for the members to, to digest in that... Um, you know, there, there, there are, I think, I think there would have been easy ways for us to approve this this evening. And we, the, the proposal we have makes it somewhat challenging to, to accept it. And that's why we're here, Councillor Abs, isn't it? Um, thank you very much, Councillor Cole. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I've got several comments, Chairman. Uh, number one is we can't change the design of the uh, uh, of the application uh, on the fly. Uh, I, I've been at several planning committee meetings when members have endeavoured to do that, but we can't. We've got to consider it as it is between before us. Uh, I think um, the. Uh, <laughs> Uh, forgive me for saying this, but I feel very strongly about this, that we are being asked to arbitrate in a neighbour dispute. Uh, that somebody has wanted to put in a, 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 a large extension, people don't like it, and it's come to us to determine, quite rightly, but uh, I, f I feel that this could have been determined with goodwill on both sides by uh, officers. Uh, I think it is an attractive design, but it's always subject subjective, um, and I think uh, it's quite nice to have something adventurous uh, the adjacent, the next door property number three has already got a bulky extension. So I feel from the street scene point of view, it, the extension on number one uh, from the front uh, actually balances the, the properties out. So my view is that um, it's an acceptable design. People are talking about fences, but 
members have got to understand that applicants can, if they want to, plant trees and shrubs along their fence line, which will probably grow up significantly taller than a two metre fence. So I don't think we should ever get bogged down about fence heights because things can change over the years. So I'm in support of this application um, and I think we should accept officer recommendation and I propose that chairman, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cole. Uh, I've got Councillor Hooker next. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, Chairman, I appreciate uh, this application was in within the town boundary, for want of a better word. Uh, I appreciate it's infill, uh, and I appreciate it's at the rear uh, and at the side. I, I've got no issue at all with the side um, extension, apart from the fact that, as Mr Tills pointed out, that the uh, party wall or the, the end wall uh, is directly on the boundary and uh, there, there will be obviously foundation issues which is not our problem it's a civil issue but uh, that's something that's got to be taken in. I mean being to the site meeting I've certainly got sympathy uh, with number three um, uh, with that uh, roof uh, and the glass albeit it is stepped back uh, and I take Councillor Cole's view that uh, that that isn't uh, such a problem. The problem I do have, surprisingly, is the one at 39. Um, I've been been to that site meeting and on that uh, on that uh, site, which was a lot lower than Number One Croft uh, Road. Um, effectively, um, from that lower position, this elevated roof virtually goes from the gutter height, virtually the whole length of the rear of their garden. Now, we've got the main wall on their boundary, and then you've got this uh, roof going across, um, taking up a large visible area. And, and I think, uh, going along, I know we're not redesigning this, but as Councillor Francis has said, that this is an unnecessary elevation. I think the architect has, uh, has, has just got, got his head and thought, well, this is what I've got to do. There are other solutions, lanterns that the, the wall doesn't have to be so close to the boundary, you could, but you know, we, we're not going to redesign it. So it is subjective. Um, I've got sympathy uh, in particular, as I say, with, uh, with uh, num number 39. Not that we look at this uh, with, with other applications we've had, but we've had applications before where we've had roof lines right on the boundary going along somebody's garden and we've not been sympathetic towards it. It is a nice design. Um, and, and it would be nice, uh, let's say, if it was further from the boundary uh, and if the site was bigger. But um, I think uh, with the, I think it, it does cause harm, uh, certainly to the, the neighbours of 39. So uh, that's my view. Whether it gets any uh, support or not, I'll wait and see from the other discussion. Well, let's see, Councillor. Thank you very much. Councillor Barnett. <laughs> Chairman, members, I've always been a strong advocate of site meetings. They're highly beneficial and they give a clear insight in the real application. Even during the lockdown, I travelled to each site, but unfortunately not able to look at sites in detail. In this case, we had a site meeting, which you could argue was probably partially hybrid, because of course we looked at the site, but we didn't look at the surrounding affected um, buildings. We had the second site visit, which I have to say, I wasn't too happy about going there yet again. But once I got there, I actually felt very happy because we actually looked at the site and the impact on the surrounding buildings, the surrounding residents. And I have to say, as what uh, Councillor Hooker said, it actually puts a completely different complexion on the view of that particular application. And, you know, I was concerned about the impact, the light and the closeness to the boundary and especially a possible hanging over to uh, the 30 at 39 and 37 Wendham Road. And I do feel that they will be affected by this particular application. Perhaps not so much necessary the light issue at number three fills um, because, of course, they're west side. But nevertheless, there's quite a visual impact and you know one has to then start thinking about there is a necessity for the applicant to consider this particular application we as members feel probably that it's a 
good site to put an application such as this and would actually benefit the uh, the site, the residents, and, and also at a time when we're all looking at, is there a real need to try and move to another suitable accommodation when you can actually look at accommodation within your own existing um, habitable um, building that you live in. So I'm in a, this particular dilemma. I feel there's a strong uh, reason to actually support this application, but I also feel strongly for the affected residents. And uh, like some of the other members have already said, um, I'm holding back and I'm holding back to the last minute because I'm still very much in the balance which way I'm going to vote, Chairman. Thank you very much, Councillor Barnett. This is a subjective thing, and um, uh, I have to say that from my own point of view, um, I, I was, from, from the point of view of number 39, yes, it will have an impact, of course it will, um, but I felt as though the, uh, the slope away from the property uh, would, would lessen the impact of that. Um, just my take, and, and members will have their own view, of course. Councillor Wollaston. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a fan of uh, modern architecture in the right place. I'm just not convinced this is the right place. I think an architect's gone off on a whim, to be perfectly honest. Um, I, I'm wholly, as I said earlier, sympathetic to the medical issues, and I don't have an issue at all with the uh, footprint of the proposed scheme. But to my way of thinking, this roof is unacceptable. Councillor Wollaston. Uh, Councillor Kant, back to you, please. Thank you, Chair. I, I just wanted to reflect on the fact that, as far as I understand it from uh, Mr. Masiwa, there aren't apparently any valid planning reasons to reject this on the grounds that we don't particularly like that sort of design on this site, that actually the, you know, the application is perfectly valid and it's within the constraints of the report of the planning officers, it appears that it's a, a reasonable application. I just ask members to reflect on that, that if we do the members that are, are, are on, on the margin of decision here and probably need to reflect on the fact that if they were to be successful in rejecting this recommendation, whether in reality um, it could be validated by uh, proper planning uh, observations rather than just subjective feelings about the site and the design. All right, uh, Council Ken, that, that is the reason we're here to interpret the, uh, the, the officer's view on, on this. Uh, I'm going to go to Councillor Abs. Um, thank you very much. I see Councillor, uh, sorry, Councillor, sorry about insulting you like that. Uh, so, but uh, um, I, you may, I'm assuming he's willing to, wanting to answer Councillor Cannon's comment about no, being no grounds. I was simply going to point out, I think there is grounds, but oh, is that what you're going to do, Mr. Till? Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Abs. Um, Chairman, um, Councillors, um, I need to um, just clarify that uh, while officers have taken the view that um, in design terms, um, the proposed works would meet the requirements um, of the council's recommendations within the SPD, uh, sorry, SPG on house extensions and um, within policy CS14, which requires a high quality of design. If members were to take an alternative view regarding the quality of design, concerned um, that would be for members to make a choice over um, that is a material planning consideration i apologize that the advice given earlier on might have seemed unclear in respect of whether that was um, a material planning consideration or not um, officers are simply advising that in our view this does meet re the requirements in terms of quality design Thank you, Mr. Till. Uh, Councillor Abbs, did you want to come in? That's what I was hoping that was going to be clarified. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, members, I see no further hands. Um, we have a proposal from Councillor Cole. Does that find a seconder? Councillor Kant. And I shall put this to the vote, members. Um, Councillor Cole, seconded by Councillor Kant, proposing acceptance of officer's recommendation. I'll take a show of hands, please. Five. Um, against? 
five and four. So by my maths, that's all of us. That motion is carried. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, members of the public, for attending this evening. Um, members, if it's all the same with you, um, a five minute uh, recess. I could do with a glass of water. Uh, welcome back. And uh, we move swiftly on to item number three on tonight's agenda, the final item, uh, 20 stroke 01264, full match, Fogham Farm, Upper Lambourne, Hungerford. Um, let's bear with me for one moment, please. Okay, moving on. Uh, Mr. Masiwa, uh, presenting again with this item. Would you like to begin your presentation, Mr. Masiwa, please? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'll just uh, share my screen. Can everyone see the presentation? We've got that, uh, Mr. Masiwa, thank you. Um, can you see the Fognum Farm application? Um, I've got uh, Western Area Planning Committee, 13th of October, 2021 up on screen. Okay. I don't know if that helps you. <laughs> We're scrolling through the uh, slides now. Merci. Yes, I beg your pardon, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think um, I'm seeing a different screen over here. Um, here we go. Yep. Um, apologies for that. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we have an update sheet as well provided for this application. Um, during the committee site visit, uh, members requested a quantification of uh, biodiversity net gain on the proposal. Um, and um, the council psychologist has indicated that um, there are no quantifiable net gain figures that were provided. However, they are satisfied um, with uh, the significant gains that are proposed um, and uh, have been negotiated into the scheme. Uh, and these are outlined, Mr. Chairman, in the update sheet. Um, during the site visits, uh, members also suggested that an hours of operation condition um, could be attached to the planning permission uh, to protect neighboring amenity. As indicated in the update sheet, officers consider that um, such condition would, would be unreasonable given the nature of the proposal, um, particularly considering as a, a um, equine facility, um, early hours of working may be required um, and as a, as a business enterprise, um, they would require that um, flexibility really. Um, so um, we've also considered that um, there are restrictions in terms of noise levels from plant and machinery, which is uh, through uh, our conditions that are within the pack. Uh, this application seeks planning permission for the removal of an existing farm building and the erection of an equine pre-training rest rehabilitation and um, recuperation um, yard. Uh, the proposal includes a, um, a manager's dwelling, uh, overnight temporary accommodation above, uh, conversion of existing building to form 28 uh, uh, boxes and stables, 
a new horse walker, new lunch pen, uh, all with a turnout area and a canter track. The proposal includes um, creation of grassland habitats to create a buffer to the triple SI. Um, the reason for referral to the committee, Mr. Chairman, is we have received more than 10 letters of objection. The representations are included in the agenda pack. Um, and the recommendation from officers is for approval subject to conditions. Uh, there are no objections received from consultees, including Environment Agency, Natural England, uh, Local Drainage Authority, uh, Ecology Officer, uh, and Highways. In addition, the councils um, commissioned a landscape consultant who has reviewed the submitted landscape impact assessment uh, and lighting assessments. Um, and the landscape consultant has no objections uh, following um, amendments to the scheme. Um, as indicated, the application is recommended for approval. Um, the site comprises Fogdon Farm located in the North Wessex Downs A O N B. It includes a large agricultural barn and a smaller storage barn surrounded by an area of hard standing. There are a number of trees within the site along the site boundaries. We have a public rights of way footpath located to the south and west, which uh, has long views into the site, as well as um, a public rights of way footpath uh, along the B4000 uh, towards the north west. Um, Fogdom Chalk Quarry site of site special scientific interest, WSI, is located to, um, to the southwest, southeast of Baker Parton, boundary as indicated on the, on the, on the plan. Um, and the site is also located within a source, groundwater source protection zone, um, which suggests it may be prone to groundwater flood risk uh, and surface water flood risk. The site contains more map shows the flood risk areas, um, uh, which you can see in, in, in uh, the pink color. Um, the proposed development um, is shown on the site plan, which is included in the pack. Um, Upper Lambourne is, uh, sur and surrounding areas are nationally important in terms of the horse racing industry. Um, the location area, the local area therefore has significant concentration of racing yards and associated equestrian facilities. This is supported by policy ADPP5 for the AONB. Um, the form of development is accepted within the AONB. Policy CS12 uh, also uh, relates to equestrian activities and the rest horse industry. Um, and the proposed development would provide investment in terms of uh, the industry um, as well as um, uh, uh, to the rural economy. We have received uh, a letter of support in consultation from the Jockey Club, um, as well as um, a letter of support from the chairman of the Lambon Trainers Association. Um, the following slides just indicate the proposed development on the site. Um, this is a, 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 an um, plans of the existing main building on the site, which will be converted to uh, stables. Uh, this uh, slide shows the proposed manager's dwelling, um, which is a three bedroom dwelling, uh, which will be in the location of the um, existing barn to be removed. Um, this uh, plan shows the uh, proposed outbuilding with um, storage below uh, a carport, uh, as well as um, 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 temporary overnight accommodation above. Um, the next slide shows the proposed horse walker, um, which is um, shown on the inset uh, uh, part of the uh, slide. Uh, and it shows uh, that it would be set down within the, uh, the ground. Um, the following slide shows the lunch pen proposed to the north of the site uh, and this is the field view into the site um, uh, towards the main band from the field. Um, and the dashed red outline shows 
the existing barn, which will be removed uh, in the location where the proposed manager's dwelling is, uh, is going to be located. Um, the following slides are just um, uh, uh, images of the um, site, which I included within the pack, um, Mr. Chairman, but I'll just go through them very quickly uh, for everyone's benefit. This shows the view of the site access. Um, we've got a view of the site access from uh, towards the B4000 and uh, we've got Fognam Bangalore located to the east. Um, some existing trees uh, uh, to the northern boundary from the uh, main barn. Um, again, we've got trees to the east, eastern boundary, um, which will all be retained. Uh, an elevation of the main barn to be converted into stables. Um, uh, and that's the southern elevation of the main barn uh, converted to stables. This uh, next slide shows the barn to be removed um, on the, um, and this is the northern elevation of the barn. And this is the location of the proposed manager's dwelling. Um, again, looking towards the eastern boundary. Uh, the next slide shows the, um, a view from the field looking north towards Fognam House um, and the location of um, the lunch pen, um, which is just to the right of your image. Um, again, um, the, the middle part of the northern boundary, which is the pump station, uh, utility pump station, um, and the view towards the north west corner of the field, which shows uh, Fognam down, which again shares the boundary with the proposed site. Um, this is a, a view towards the uh, tree belt uh, located to the southwest. Um, and again, uh, a view towards the south, uh, towards where the uh, public footpaths are located. Uh, uh, and these footpaths has, um, uh, um, have um, uh, views into the site as shown on the field view uh, earlier in the presentation. Um, the large bank you can see to the left in the image is the triple SI, um, and the boundary is just at the bottom of the, uh, of the band or the bank in there. Uh, again, we can see the boundary of um, to the triple SI, um, the fence just uh, at the bottom of the bank. Again, um, the band to be removed looking towards um, the triple SI from, uh, from within the field. Um, that ends the presentation, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Masiwa. Um, Mr. Goddard, uh, do you have anything to contribute? Y yes, please, Chairman. Um, your hiring officers have, have obviously assessed the proposal. Um, firstly, let's mm -hmm. talk about the, the access. Um, it is sufficiently wide uh, for the proposal in our view. Uh, sight lines onto the B4000. Mr. Gallard, sorry, can you just hold that thought for one moment, please? And I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Masiwa, um, we're still screen sharing, um, if we can go back to the, the gallery view, please. I'm having some technical difficulties, actually, uh, Mr. Chairman. But... Um... If the host can uh, stop sharing. Mr. God, I will just wait until we're uh, we're back in the that's fine. The gallery. Okay, we're back up and running again, Mr. Goddard. Thank you. Um, so the, the access with regards to width and geometry is acceptable. Uh, sight lines 
onto the B4000 are slightly substandard, but, but really very marginally so. Um, for they did, the, the applicants, highway consultants did do some uh, speed surveys uh, near the, the site access itself and found that traffic from the east was traveling at 44.9 miles per hour, which requires 126 meters uh, sight line. 123 has been provided, so it's three meters short. From the other direction, uh, from the west, um, uh, vehicle speeds of, this is 85th percentile, by the way, um, 43 miles per hour uh, was recorded, which requires 118 meters, um, but 110 has been provided. So yes, the sight lines are slightly short, but not sufficient in our view uh, to sustain uh, an objection uh, and that would be sustained at appeal. Um, traffic generation, it has been projected that there would be uh, around 15 vehicle movements per day on average. And that's about seven or eight vehicles in, uh, seven or eight vehicles out. Um, it is the view of your highway officers uh, that, that this is not uh, in any way significant. And uh, therefore there are no concerns regarding traffic generation and the proposal in general. And therefore your highway officers um, recommend approval. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Garrard. Um, we'll come back with questions from members in a moment. Uh, uh, but first, we're going to go to our uh, parish representative, uh, Vicky Reuni. I hope I've pronounced that something like right. Um, and if I could uh, ask Miss Booth to uh, allow our, our guest into the into the meeting, please. Um, Ms. Remy, if you'd be good enough to unmute yourself and turn your video on, please. Um, I, be uh -uh. I believe I have turned my video on. Give me one moment. Ah, there we are. There you are. Um, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Um, I'm sure you've been following the procedure and uh, you, you, you know how we're going to go. You've got five minutes to say your piece. Uh, after four minutes, I'll give you fair war I'll give you a minute's warning and then uh, 10, 10 seconds to wrap up um, if, if, if needs be. So when you're ready, I'll, I'll, I'll start the clock. Thank you. Uh, good evening, I'm Vicky Reunier, Parish Councillor for Upper Lambourne. I'm representing Lambourne Parish Council and I'm raising an objection on behalf of the council. Lambourne Parish Council objects to this application due to the inadequate protection of the North Wessex Downs AONB which is a national landscape designation and the Frognam Chalk Quarry SSSI. We believe there's a lack of proper information provided regarding the site, for example, the transport survey and design and access statements. Natural England's consultation response included the advice that the relevant AONB partnership or conservation board should be consulted, stating their knowledge of the site and its wider landscape setting together with the aims and objectives of the AONB's statutory management plan will be a valuable contribution to the planning decision. However, the document provided to the planning committee has been left blank in respect to the response from the North Wessex Downs AONB team. But I have seen an email confirming that Rebecca Davis of this team has been in contact with the case officer and raised a number of concerns which do not appear to have been addressed. Paragraph 115 of the National Planning Policy Framework states that great weight should be given to conserving landscape and scenic beauty in AONBs. Paragraph 116 advises that in coming to a determination of such a planning application under this policy, the committee are required not simply to weigh all material considerations in a balanced manner, but to refuse an application unless you are satisfied that firstly, there are exceptional circumstances and secondly, it's demonstrated that despite giving great, great weight to conserving the landscape and scenic beauty in the AONB, the development is in the public interest. Whilst the scheme should be considered a major development, we believe the policy tests relating to exceptional circumstances had not been satisfied, including assessment of alternatives. 
We also believe that the applicant cannot adequately demonstrate that this development is in the public interest. Should the planning committee authorise this development, one that we believe would inflict significant harm to the AONB, we would request that substantial reasons for doing so are given. The document provided to the planning committee does highlight that a previous application was agreed, although not developed. One of the conditions was the erection of temporary accommodation for staff and managers, with a time limit of three years put in place. We would request that the same conditions be put in place for this application should it be approved. As the proposal involves outdoor lighting and Upper Lambourne is in a dark skies area, we would request a statement that justifies why the lighting proposed is necessary for its intended use and that shows every reasonable effort, effort to mitigate sky glow and light intrusions has been addressed. We would also like to highlight our major concern in respect of the additional traffic the development would generate. The road access does have poor visibility and blind bends leading to it. Large horse transporters turning into the access will need to come almost to a stop to turn. I'm a local with experience of how quickly drivers take the bends. There's the potential for serious accidents there. Just to clarify, a pre-training yard is not for horses that are actively racing. It is for the rest, recuperation or introduction to saddle of untrained young horses. It does not need access to the specialist facilities and gallops found nearby. So a yard of this nature could be located anywhere. There are no exceptional circumstances for it to be located at this site within the AONB adjoining a triple SI site. Lambourne Parish Council considers this development is unsuitable and the harm done to the AONB is not outweighed by other considerations. It urges you to reject this application. Thank you. I was about to say one minute left, but uh, you've come in one minute just under time. So well done. Thank you for that. Members, questions, please. I've got Councillor Cole. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm interested that you are emphasising the, uh, the AOMB and the SSSI, which is uh, laudable. However, has Lambourne Parish Council given consideration to our policy CS12 in coming to this conclusion? Yes, we have. So am I to understand that Lambourne Parish Council are not as supportive of the horse racing industry uh, and more supportive of the AOMB? Um, what I would say is we take every application and look at the pros and cons and try to take a balanced approach. In the case of this application, um, we feel that the AOMB AM, um, is, should be taken as an important consideration. Thank you. Uh, can I just have a further question? Uh, you mentioned the fact that the um, AOMB uh, planning consultant had made comments, but there is nothing in our report to say that. And I would be very surprised if officers had neglected to give that information. Um, so I will be pursuing that when I'm asking questions of clarification. But as far as I can see, the AOMB have not uh, not made any comments, and that is not unusual for them in my experience with planning applications. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cole. Uh, looking around the room, members, no other questions? Uh, Ms. Rudino, thank you very much indeed for joining us this evening. And uh, Ms. Booth, I'd ask you to escort her back to the, the waiting room. Thank you very much. Um, that was the parish council. Um, we now move on to objectors, and I've got uh, Mr. Charles Lochran, uh, who's joining us by Zoom. I'll just allow him time to to join us. Uh, Mr. Lochran, if you'd be good enough to unmute yourself and turn on your camera, please. It's not video. Can you see me, Mr. Chairman? I can indeed, Mr. Lochran. And you can hear us. You can hear us okay. You can all you can obviously hear me as well. Thank I you. can indeed. Mr. Lochran, you know how we go. We've got uh, rather you've got five minutes to address the committee. Uh, after four minutes, I'll give you a warning and then a 10-second wrap-up uh, if necessary. When you're, when you're good and ready, I'll start the clock. Thank you. My name is Charles Lochrain. I'm a fellow of the Royal Institution of Charter Surveyors and have specialised in commercial real estate investment and development for over 40 years. 
uh, conducted analyses of the various non-technical statements submitted in support of the application and highlighted many errors and omissions, most of which do not need to be repeated. Of particular concern, however, is the transport statement and the access design, which is quite frankly dangerous. This document was flawed for a number of reasons. It used 40-year-old traffic movement assumptions. It used data from a traffic count taken three years ago in the middle of winter when the traffic speeds through the bend would inevitably have been slower. It produced an access design acknowledged to be inadequate, but because of the relatively small number of traffic movements accepted by the highway authority. This ignored the fact that a significant proportion of those traffic movements would be slow moving horse transports. The visibility, the visibility displays in the design were acknowledged to be inadequate, but accepted in view of the traffic movements I referred to, ignoring the fact that the majority of the area covered by the visibility displays is out with the control of the applicant and is either part of the public highway or in private ownership. As a result, compliance with condition 17 in the officer's recommendation will be almost impossible. It denied that the road at Fognam Gwen Corner is a blind bend, which itself evidently is. Turning to the agent's justification report, I should first state that the pre-app consultation and its financial appraisal attached to the business case were redacted from the relevant reports. It took an FOI application to extract them. The pre-app consultation advised that the application must be supported by a sustainable business case demonstrating need, financial viability, and justifying any temporary or permanent accommodation. It recommended the applicant to present a strong business case with any application. No such strong business case has been made. The agent makes a persuasive equine management case, but fails to justify the need for such a specialist facility nearly two miles out of the village when there are several yards and development opportunities on the market in the village currently, some with recuperation facilities and an existing specialist facility in the middle of the village. The business projection is based on 100% occupancy and indicates a net profit of £35,000. However, there is no provision for cost of capital, site cost or an equity return. There's an overhead cost of £5,000 for rent and rates. However, expert advice I have suggests that the business rates would be more like £30,000 per annum and the rental value about £50,000. This alone would wipe out any profit and produce a substantial loss. I've assessed the cost of developing this facility at, at circa £1.9 million, including fees, construction finance and an allowance for site value at the lower end of the applicant's expectations. I presented a detailed financial appraisal to the planning officers in my letter of the 1st of February. This demonstrated that taking the applicant's forecasts at face value, but including a carrying cost of acquiring a site and carrying out the development, the business will make a loss of nearly 100,000 before making any allowance for return on equity. The application therefore fails to provide the robust business case required by the pre-app consultation report. I would also like to correct some errors and omissions in the officer's recommendation. The report states that no comment has been received from the Northwest, uh, uh, from the NWD AONB team. I have circulated an email I received from them confirming that they had engaged with the case officer and objected to the original scheme. They also expressed continuing concerns with the revised scheme, the position of the counter track, the level of external lighting and the size of the manager's house. The report indicates that the house has been reduced in size in the redesign. No, the size of the house has actually increased from 1800 square feet to 2200. Moving staff accommodation to the permanent flat over the garage has increased the residential accommodation by 45%. There is no mention of the asbestos present in the existing buildings. Asbestos is a hazardous waste and the control of asbestos regulations 2012 imposed legal duties on occupiers and developers for its management and disposal. Only one recommended condition, 22A, has any chance of capturing this risk but That's does not go nearly far away. Mr Lockrane. The disposal of asbestos must be the subject of a separate condition to ensure its safe removal and disposal. Conditions four and five must be secured by a section 106 agreement. The report indicates that the applicants have resolved all the technical design issues sufficient to satisfy the various policies. However, many serious concerns remain. The immediate neighbours have no doubt that the reality of the noise, light pollution, flood risk, traffic impact, etc., will not bear out the officer's confidence. The majority of the other objectors were principally concerned about an unwarranted and unjustified incursion into the precious AONB with dangerous precedent it sets. There is no support for this application from the demographic that matters, the community. Mr Chairman, good planning practice is not a science, but an art which should balance economic justification and in conclusion, environmental desirability. Planning policies are designed to guide, not regulate. To assume they perform any other purpose is to misunderstand their function. Thank you. That's down to the second. Well done. Thank you very much, Mr Loughran. Uh, members, do we have any 
questions of Mr. Lockren. Quite a bit to digest there, I think. Um, I think, looking around the room, we can let you go, sir. But thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, now moving on to the agent, the applicant, uh, we have Mr. James Fraser joining us here in the chamber this evening. If you'd like to take the lectern, please, sir. And when you're good and ready, I shall start the clock. Good evening, Chairman and Councillors. The scheme before you is the result of considerable discussions with officers. From the original pre-app through the formal application So I'll just stop you there, and I'll, I'll stop the clock as well. If I can just ask you to bring yourself a little closer oh, my, to the microphone, Sorry, just so that we can uh, pick you up. Okay, George. Yeah. Sorry, one, one second, Councillor Abbs. Oh, right, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Abbs. Let me know. <laughs> Councillor Cole, give me a nod when you're, when you're ready. I think we'll start your time again. Uh, again yeah. So we'll just, uh, when, when Council Cole's ready to, we're good? Okay. Okay, and uh, clock, clock starts now. The scheme before you is the result of considerable discussions with officers. From the original pre-app through the formal application process to the later discussions regarding technical details, we have fully engaged with the council to resolve any issues raised. The scheme has changed significantly from the original pre-app and submission to address these issues and include changing the house design to address landscape comments and reduce any impact on the AOMB, reduction in the number and location of staff accommodation units, reorientation of the counter track, increased amounts of ecological and landscape improvements to provide biodiversity net gain, which include additional native tree and hedgerow planting, bat and bird nesting boxes, and a wild meadow planting forming a buffer between the development and the triple SI amounting to one hectare, providing a detailed external lighting design to ensure compliance with dark night sky policies and ensuring dark night dark corridors are retained for wildlife. No lighting is proposed or intended for the counter track. Revised surface water drainage scheme and strategy to address concerns regarding groundwater flooding and ensure a robust SUD scheme is provided. All aspects of the scheme have been reviewed and scrutinized during the application process by the council's own landscape consultant, highways and drainage department, ecology officer, environmental health, archaeological and tree officers, along with other external consultees, including the AOMB, National, uh, sorry, Natural England, the EA and Thames Water. Following the in-depth discussion and changes, all consultees have found the application acceptable and have raised no objections to the revised scheme, and the application is before you with a recommendation for approval. While the original scheme raised a number of objections from the, the community, the level of objections following the changes have considerably reduced, with one of the direct neighbours removing their objection. Furthermore, the proposal is supported by the Jockey Club and the Lambourne Racehorse Trainers Association as it supports the local racehorse industry in Lambourne in line with policy CS12. While officers are proposing a considerable number of conditions, this is not uncommon in an increasingly complex world. The proposed conditions provide the council with the necessary reassurance and control to ensure the scheme and its details would be undertaken as intended and agreed with, various, with the various consultees. During the committee site visit, a number of points were raised regarding ecology and sustainability. On ecology, we have worked closely with the council's ecologist and his, assist and his assistance ha has helped us to, sorry, start again. On ecology, we have worked closely with the council's ecologist and with his assistance have agreed a scope of ecology, landscape and habitat improvements, which meet and exceed officer and policy requirements. On sustainability, the project, due to its nature, is not specifically covered by existing council policies. However, there is a clear need to ensure development is made sustainable. The residential elements will comply with the latest building standards, which provide a tight control on energy consumption and generation. 
on the scheme's other elements, reusing an existing barn rather than replacing it is a greener way of building, and the existing barn is ideally located with a large south-facing roof slope to potentially accommodate solar panels, as many other farm buildings do. We believe the resulting proposal is a better, more integrated scheme than the one we started with, and I'm happy to answer any questions the committee may have. And that's the end of your presentation. Thank you yes. very much, Mr. Fraser. Um, I'm going to go to members now and Councillor Culver. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you for coming and giving a presentation tonight. Could you expand, please, on your business case for this? It's previously been mentioned that there's not a business case. Can you give us a bit more detail about that, please? In in, in what aspect? Um, what? You know, do you feel there is a business case for this? Have you done your research and said this is something that people need locally? Yes, yes, we have. Actually, and before we go into that, uh, Councillor Cole, that was a, another presentation. Um, it wasn't from, from Mr Fraser, okay. I think so. With respect, Chairman, I'm quite keen to hear from the applicant about what whether he thinks there's a business case, has he done his research I'm into doing, whether there's a business case. Uh, thank you, Councillor Cole. I'm going to ask Mrs Mark. No, we're not. We, we, yeah. <coughs> okay. Just questions of clarification. Thank you, Councillor Culver. Councillor Abs, please. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, you mentioned sustainable energy, and you may have heard me mention it on site, in fact. Um, so CS15, you've been sitting there all evening. So you, you'll guess what my question is going to be. Have you, have you thought about that particular policy and how you will meet its conditions? Um, in in general terms, yes. I mean, obviously, there is no no requirement to provide a BREAM assessment because the commercial element doesn't doesn't fall within the scope. But of, there is a residential. Of that. Uh, but there is a residential element. So yes, we would look to ensure the house complies with the, the current so, regulations. So, you, so you really, if you're conditioned to deliver a net zero home, you would be quite happy to do that. Um, in, in an ideal world, no, but if that is the requirement that the council no. wish to, then yes. Um, okay. I'm um, just curious as to where you're standing. Yeah. I'm looking at Councillor Abbs to Mr. Till, I'm sure he's going to say that that's not part of this. Thank you, Chairman. Um, policy CS15 in respect to minor residential development um, originally referred to the codes for sustainable homes. Um, it BRIAM doesn't apply to um, residential development, and the Code for Sustainable Homes was debunked and gotten rid of by um, the government um, in, I believe, 2014. Um, that leaves us with um, an absence of policy that requires um, provision of sustainable energy measures for um minor residential development councillor abs so um, i'm concerned um that the discussion um here is around um going um beyond the requirements of policy um, in terms of um what um what the, what the applicant's being requested um and that cs15 doesn't actually provide us with justification for that thank you chairman thank you mr till um um, thank you, Joe. I, I totally accept that, that that is what the officer uh, believes. Um, I, I think as members, I, I interpret that slightly different. And I was simply testing whether the applicant would be willing to uh, go along with, it, if not the the absolute of the uh, policy, the, the intent of the policy, which was to be delivering net zero homes by this point. Thank, thank you, Councillor Abs. Uh, any further questions, please, members? Uh, we have no, Mr. Fraser, and thank you very much for your presentation and for coming along this evening. Uh, I now turn to the ward member, Councillor Wollaston. If you'd thank like you, to address Jim. the nation from your, from your seat. <laughs> I would prefer to, thank you, Chair. I shall start the clock uh, when you're good and ready. Okay. I think this is a tight and finely balanced decision. As I've said, I've been lobbied heavily by both the applicant and various local objectors. So that it might, might help the committee if I set out the advantages and disadvantages of the proposal as I see them as ward member. First, the advantages. Lambourne is the second most important racehorse training centre in the UK after Newmarket. We have about 1,800 horses under training in a war with a population of about 4,500 people. And it generates over 25 million pounds a year to the local economy. 
and is the most significant employer. The existing semi-derelict barn is, in my view, an eyesore, and the proposal will certainly improve its, its appearance. The access proposal will be a significant improvement from a visual perspective, and it protects the immediately adjacent site of special scientific interest. Now the disadvantages. I'm not convinced that the proper business case is proven. The location is a considerable way away from the main training yards. It will have significant impact, both in terms of appearance and noise to near neighbors. There is the danger of light pollution in an area of dark skies, and it's part of the AOMB. Members may not be aware that the North Wessex Downs AOMB is seriously under-resourced, so the lack of a formal objection does not mean they are not concerned. Notwithstanding highways support, I remain concerned about the sight lines at the access between two blind bends on a road where traffic speeds are high, as I think we saw uh, on the inspection. A horse box turning in or coming out could be re extremely dangerous. To give the applicant credit, they have made great efforts to resolve issues such as water runoff, orientation of the track, odours, the removal of horse dung and access issues. The big issue, to my mind, is whether this is a viable business prop proposition or is it a Trojan horse to get a residential unit in a wonderful spot in the AOMB. If members are minded to support officer's recommendation to approve, I would strenuously urge the very tightest conditions on the residential being tied for good to the equestrian use, including, if it is possible, that if the equestrian use ceases, then occupation of the residential should follow suit. I'm obviously been told earlier that uh, strict hours of operation are not achievable, but I think this is disappointing in an area support surrounded by three houses. I will listen to the debate before making my decision on what is locally a highly controversial application. Thank you, Councillor Wilston. Uh, members, questions of the board member, please. No. Thank you, Councillor Wilston. Um, we're going to come now to the debate. No. Are we not? Clarification. Council Cole. Uh, I, I'm so do apologise. I'm jumping the gun. Um, members of clarification of the officers. You're quite right, Councillor Cole. Um, Councillor Culver. Thank you, Chairman. Um, we decided after COVID began that we would give consideration to economic benefits of planning applications in addition to considering things like the AONB and the impact and so on. But are officers convinced that there is a business case for this? And have they been given evidence that there is a need for this as opposed to just thinking it's good to create jobs in principle? Are we going to put that to, to Mr. Masiwa? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Calva. Um, yes, um, officers are, are convinced, convinced with, with the business case. Um, uh, we, we, we reviewed the business case which was submitted. We consulted uh, the, the local jockey club, uh, who was a consultee in terms of uh, policy C CS12 development in the area. Um, and we also had a letter of support from the Lambon um, Trainers Association. Um, um, the, the proposal is for um, a, a spelling yard, which um, um, it, it provides um, a, a associate support for, uh, for, for the race, racehorse trainers. Um, and uh, we're convinced that the justification report which we have made public um, as part of the proposal. Um, I think the applicant agreed to that following the representations. Um, it does indicate that they, they is, there is a need for the facility um, within the area. Um, and as indicated, that has also been uh, indicated by the Jockey Club in their comments, uh, as well as the Lambon Trainers Association. Um, as officers, we are, um, required to um, uh, consider application and determine in accordance with the development plan. The racehorse industry is supported by um, three separate policies within the core strategy. Uh, one policy um, refers to the uh, Newbury race course. Uh, the other policy is the ADPP5. AONB policy itself, it, it talks about the racehorse industry uh, and that is an accepted um, rural use of land within the AONB uh, and the need to support the, the, the racehorse industry. 
and that's within the AONB policy. Uh, and policy CS12, which directly refers to the resource industry, uh, requires that um, planning officers consider uh, favorably uh, any uh, development that supports the, the, the industry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, before I go to Councillor Cole, I'll just uh, uh, ask Mr. Masiwa uh, from the chair. Um, is there anything stopping, this has clearly been a, a working farm. Uh, is there anything stopping this from being a working farm going forward? Tomorrow, for instance? Um, there, there, is, um, there is nothing stopping the, the farm to um, being revamped uh, and, and used um, uh, uh, as a farm. Uh, as indicated in the report as well, Mr. Chairman, um, there have been previous equine applications of the site, um, be it that they have been, um, it's been quite a number of years now since the, the applications were approved, uh, but the two applications were never implemented. Um, so the idea of uh, citing an equine establishment on the site has been considered previously um, and uh, has been um, uh, approved. Um, uh, in, in terms of the, the, the impacts, um, the movements, the vehicle movements, the highway officers are not particularly concerned because the existing uses on the site um, are synonymous with the proposed uses and the numbers will be similar. Um, so in that respect, um, yes, the, the, the site can be um, uh, uh, used um, in its current form with similar impacts. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Masio, I was just establishing really, I suppose, you know, clearly this is a, 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 an enterprise that's uh, been in abeyance for some time uh, and um, there's nothing stopping it from uh, uh, taking on a commercial uh, uh, footing again in, in, in the future, be it as a farm or uh, as an equestrian spelling yard. Uh, Councillor Cole. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. Um, this is just a question for clarification, really. Um, the, um, the parish council representatives uh, seem to suggest that uh, you had received comments from the AOMB with regard to this application, although on the uh, committee report it says no comments received. So can you just um, indicate, please, whether or not uh, any AOMB representation has been received? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cole. Um, uh, well, the, we haven't received any uh, formal consultation from the AONB. Um, we consulted the AONB when the application was submitted. Um, we um, received um, uh, um, uh, um, correspondence via representation from the local residents um, who were in contact with the AONB. Um, and in those correspondence, there were some uh, concerns raised by the AONB board. Um, we wrote to the AONB uh, after the representations, asking for them to make their formal comments, um, but we, we, uh, we didn't receive uh, any formal comments. Does that uh, answer your question? Thank you, Councillor Cole. Councillor Hooker. Thank you, Chairman. Um, is there a planning issue for, for my benefit? And I'm sure um, people watching uh, this meeting this evening, uh, the committee uh, receive applications on uh, redundant farms like this for either residential home or homes. And I'm sure members will remember the last farm we looked at where we were absolutely um, critical that uh, as much as possible could be retained uh, of a barn or barns uh, to put in these residential homes. What's the difference with this site where this residential home's going in on the footprint of a barn, which is being allowed to be knocked down? Uh, just a, a, an observation as to why is this site different, let's say, to other uh, redundant barns that uh, seek uh, residential house uh, homes? Um, and uh, there's a requirement to uh, convert, let's say, the barn or won't let that barn be, be um, taken down. When it comes to the actual barn itself for the livery, uh, that is being retained and, and, and that is being refurbished. Thank you, Chair. I'm looking across to you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, in respect of um, the considerations here, uh, we, we have a specific policy in respect of 
reuse of um, redundant agricultural buildings. Um, now, a reuse of a redundant agricultural building is one concern, and we would apply one set of considerations under that policy to it. Um, but we have a separate policy in respect of delivery of um, horse riding and livery and um, uh, racing industry associated establishments. Um, and that um, includes um, reference to associated need for residential development. And the, the, the simple answer to this is they're two separate policies with two separate sets of requirements. And um, we're not considering purely a residential conversion. We're considering a residential associated business use. Thank you, Chairman. That was linked with uh, Councillor Wollaston's uh, comment of uh, a foot in the door of a residential home. Uh, the damage is done at this stage. The barn is gone, but uh, we, we're not looking at the future. But I, I, I appreciate his concern. Thank you, Councillor Hooker. Councillor Barnett. Um, well, well, a question through you, Chairman, could well uh, probably should have been asked early on. Um, it's coming back about on, on this sort of speed and highways issue. Um, a clarification is whether um, if, if it is a case that uh, uh, we've got two dangers bends and the possibility from comments have already been made in relationship to uh, uh, speeds, although uh, 85 quartiles mentioned about 43.5 or 43.8 speed. Um, is there any way, and, and this is uh, probably through you, Chairman, to, to Paul Goddard, um, proper signage could be part of the the application um, requirement uh, look to uh, signage to the effect where moving vehicles are aware uh, along that road that there could be a horse box or HGV moving out into the highway out of a side turn which would be uh, giving some warning if uh, somebody was traveling at speed and the speed of course is a national speed along that section, which could be in excess of what we've just heard. Mr. Goddard? My advice would be that, that such signage is, is necessary. Um, I, I'm sorry, we, we rather lost you there, the, the most crucial part of your uh, opening statement. If you repeat that, please. But my advice would be that, that such signage uh, wouldn't be necessary in this case. And I would need to take advice from colleagues in, in, in traffic management on whether such signage could be provided. But I'll go back and say that they're, they're not required for a number of points. Um, firstly, I, I'm only expecting from the, the, the submissions that the applicants have made about two out per day. And it also needs to be considered that there was a farm there before that would have had uh, such large vehicles coming in and out. Uh, maybe even more vehicles coming in and out. And notwithstanding that, the proposed access is actually being widened to 5.5 metres, which does make it easier for large vehicles, large horse boxes, um, to manoeuvre in and out um, from the site access. I hope that is helpful. Thank you, Mr. Gardner. Uh, Councillor Barnett, does that uh, answer your questions? Ch Chairman, I, I think uh, it's up for debate. I was just wondering whether that could have formed part of the uh, uh, conditions. That was all. Uh, so obviously, uh, the recommendation from uh, Mr. Goddard is is no. Uh, there's there's possibly been, there has been in the past, and there probably won't need to in the future. So I have to concede on that. Thank you, Councillor Barnett. Councillor Moore, how do you next? Are you out? No, I'm out. Okay. Count. Okay, thank you. Councillor Abs. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, I think it was uh, uh, Mr Lochrane who <laughs> said at one point, it's not smaller, it's bigger, or I'm paraphrasing somewhat. So offices, is it smaller or is it bigger? Mr Masiwa, did you catch that? You're on mute. Um, okay. In reference to what is smaller, Councillor... Oh, sorry, the residential portion of the, the development. Uh, okay. uh, Mr Locker made a specific point of it actually being, the officer's comment being wrong. It isn't smaller, it's in fact bigger. Well, that's how I remembered him saying it, so I wrote it down as such. So, 
thank you, Councillor Abs. Uh, um, it is smaller. Um, when the application was uh, originally submitted, it was a larger dwelling. Um, and um, uh, as I indicated, um, in discharging our duty in terms of the AONB, we commissioned the lands our, our landscape consultant who reviewed the uh, proposals um, and um, raised concern about the size of the uh, original dwelling on the site. Um, and since it has been amended and uh, reduced in size. Okay, so we can 100% rely on the officer's kind of reading of that. That's that's how I'm interpreting what you just said, so that's good. Second one is more of a clarification for myself, CS15, flood zone one, sequential tests, needed, not needed? Um, in terms of flood zone, uh, yes, the site is located in flood zone one. Um, and um, yes, there's no requirement for a sequential test um, on this particular site. Um, and um, well, yes. sorry, uh, uh, could, would you mind just expanding on that? Uh, what why it's not needed in this case? Well, I've just been subject to other planning applications in flood zone one, which did want one, did require it. So I'm just curious why this one doesn't. Um, happy to pick that up, or Mr. Masir, are you happy to go with that? Yes, um, I, I, I can do. I mean, the the, the planning practice guidance um, uh, has a criteria of what 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 is considered um, vulnerable development um, and uh, flood zones that are considered to be high risk or flooding. Um, so, if a site is located in flood zone two and three, uh, then uh, it is subject to a sequential test if the proposed use is um, are considered more vulnerable. Uh, for example, if it's uh, residential. Uh, as indicated, the site is in flood zone one, which is um, it's got the lowest probability and a sequential test is not required in, in flood zone one. Okay, thank you very much for clarifying that for me. And finally, um, sorry, Mr. Mr. Till, I need to come back to CS15 again. I do want to be 100% clear on it because um, going forward, I think it's very important for members to be right on the ball here. Um, so bear with me, everybody, please, a little bit why I, I go through it, because it's what's confusing me. And every time in, I sit in front of me, the, one of these, I get more confused. So um, it clearly mentions the code for sustainable homes. The government threw that out. I think we all know that. That's fine. But the intent of West Berkshire was built into where, where it was at the time. So that's fine. We have non-residential bit, which we, we're ignoring here. We're only, I'm only focusing on the residential development part. And it goes on, and I'll, I'll, I'll even skip the fact that Bream's not relevant. I'll go straight to renewable energy, where it clearly says, all right, I can focus on the learning on it, so the percentage reductions in CO2 emissions should be based on an estimated CO2 emissions of the development after the installation of energy efficiency measures related to either the, either the code for sustainable homes gone, Bream gone, or equivalent method has been applied. So we've still got all equivalent method that can be applied. And there's plenty of stuff out there talking about how to do it. So residential portion from 2016, zero carbon. Uh, that, that, that's, so I, when I read it in that order, I go, okay, even though those bits have gone, I'm still from 26 on, 2016 onwards, should have been delivering zero carbon homes based on equivalent method has been applied. That's right, Mr. Till. Thank you, Chairman. Um, the, I'm afraid, um, Councillor Abs, that the advice from the policy officer is that the um, for a single residential unit, we can't request zero carbon. Um, that That is the interpretation of our um, chief policy officer. For a single? For a single residential dwelling. Okay, um, so we, we have, but here we have a, a residential dwelling, a permanent dwelling for the, the manager to live in, plus other accommodation. Uh, so how is this a single dwelling? Does the temporary... Uh, well, this is, the, the, the reason we're exploring it, because I don't see one person living there. I, see, I saw lots of people living there at different points in time, so... I, I think in that particular case, um, the 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 accommodation that you're talking about is occasional accommodation. It isn't considered to be permanent residential accommodation. Um, that <laughs> that's the distinction. But we're we're running a. Would you don't agree that we are starting to run a pretty fine line between when it would apply and when it wouldn't apply? Then 
I think, Councillor Abs, that um, it, it would be safe to say that uh, your development control officers agree with you that having a policy that fits these things <laughs> um, more clearly okay. would be very helpful. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Patel. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Patel. Thank you. Okay, members, uh, I see no further hands, and I'm going to open this up to the debate. The first I have is Councillor Kant, please, Councillor Kant. Uh, thank you, Chair. Well, th this has been quite informative and very interesting report, actually, with a lot of technical uh, input. So, to me, this is very finely balanced, as C Councillor Woolaston so succinctly put it. In terms of the OM o AOMB issue, as I see it, um, applying common sense, I see a lot of pictures put up by Mr. Masiwa of a very scruffy field surrounded by some rather unkempt banks and a dingy barn, which is about to be replaced by presumably a much more attractive building. So it feels to me as if it's not going to detract from this area in any way that, that could possibly be complained about by a more general view of it. I think Councillor Cole made a very important point about supporting businesses in, in terms of our policy. Uh, you know, West Park is predominant nationally for horse racing. And uh, I think we should certainly pay a lot of attention to uh, to businesses who are enhancing that reputation and the facilities for horse racing. Number three on the business case, I personally have always been very nervous about challenges to the financial viability of schemes. If organisations are happy to put very large sums of money into our local community to develop their businesses, unless there's an outrageously poor uh, case uh, or it's going to be very detrimental ultimately to the, to the area my feeling is it's not really for us to judge that specifically the business case is for them to be concerned about and i think the final thing where uh, council Woodhurst made a very good point is um is uh, personally i'm always concerned about uh, residential development being a, as he described a, tr a trojan horse but on page 85 dwelling op occupation number five there is a constraint being introduced which it, it may be tight, tight enough, it may not, but seems to imply that this organisation will not be able to use this dwelling for anything other than an employee. So I think for that reason, although I accept that there are lots of arguments for and against, I'm inclined to support this application. Thank you, Councillor Kant. Uh, Councillor Abs, my apologies if you were first cab off the rank. I don't, I, I, I I, I don't think it matters, I'm sure. Uh, Councillor um, Abs. Thank you very much, Chairman. We had... Um, I think a very persuasive uh, presentation from the parish councillor. I, I can't. I don't think in two years I've seen anybody speak more eloquently from that level and in such detail with clear knowledge of our policies. So I was absolutely convinced by her arguments that, that they were valid arguments when she spoke. Slightly countered as we went along, but basically I, I left that piece thinking, hmm, blimey. Um, then we had uh, an objector come in who clearly also knows what he's talking about and went in an awful lot of, gave me an awful lot of detail and reasons to again say why I shouldn't be going forward with this in, in my mind. And then I'm also stuck on, I think we have a policy that we're not applying CS15 that isn't even down as being applicable to this particular ap application, but I can't see why it isn't at least considered as part of this when it was considered in previous applications earlier on as being valid, but then, and then swept aside again for on a technicality. So I'm absolutely convinced that we should be testing CS15 in, uh, at, uh, at the next level, at the appeal level. Until we test it at the appeal level, we are on the opinion of experienced people, experienced officers, but I've been in that situation where I've been one of those objectors and um, it was to do with <laughs> it was to do with flats nearby, but basically me going, we should we shouldn't have them, and if, well, well, and it was a repeat application, and the officer said we was asked, would you actually be um, saying reject if you hadn't the previous time it hadn't been approved? We said he said yes, we would reject it. It went to appeal, and in fact, we we the, the West Berkshire won at, and, and at that level. So so I think we need to test the S fifteen. And this is absolutely, unfortunately, for, for the applicant, um, you know, he, he could have removed that objection very easily for me. And I tried to get that opportunity earlier to say, well, actually, you know, the residential can conform to the spirit of CS15, even if we were, we were struggling to, 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 to test it. So I combine all that lot together, 
and unfortunately, I, I just can't. I, I, I get the jobs. Uh, but one of the other things that, you know, all of this uh, sequential test, flood risk assessment, you generally build anywhere you can that's not any flood risk. Not, you don't tend to build there first. And it was clearly pointed out there's lots of other locations in the land It won't f affect the racing community that I've ever, that I've ever come across. So I, won't, I, I will be proposing, in fact, that we reject it if we get that far. Thank you, Councillor Abs. Um, members, any other views? Deafening silence. Councillor Culver, thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, regarding the condition that the house cannot be built until the equestrian facilities are finished, bearing in mind the argument is that there needs to be on-site accommodation in order to look after the horses. Is it reasonable for us to say that they can't build the house until the um, facilities are finished? I'll just throw that out there as to be controversial. I just wonder if it's reasonable for us to ask that. And bearing in mind, you know, are, are we saying that there could be a situation where there are already horses in place and then you're going to start building a house? Is that reasonable if you've already got horses on site? Somebody can cogitate. Councillor Cand? Yes, I'm sorry, Chair, if, if I'm, it wasn't absolutely clear where Councillor Abbs got to at the end of what he said, but I, I was just going to propose that we move to support the recommendation of officers. Mm -hmm. I have a proposal. Sorry, Chair, I right. the opposite proposal was just before, I believe, from myself. Did, was that a formal proposal? Was that a formal proposal? Yes, I'll be proposing that uh, we, we reject. I wasn't oh, sure I'm you had to go either way. If you have to see what members want to do, but I'm not, I don't think it's going to matter with the result. <laughs> from the chair, and I've, thank you, thank you, councillors. Uh, from the chair and with uh, legal advice, I, I must say I, I didn't take that. As as a formal proposal, that's no problem then, Chairman. With um, my apologies, and and I, I will take Councillor Kant's proposal. I'm I'm looking around the room for some more contribution though first before we. Councillor Cole, I apologise. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I understand Councillor Abs's. Um, aspirations with regard to policy CS15, but we are where we are with it. That policy was written at the time of the course strategy when it was adopted in 2012. We know that the code for sustainable homes was chucked out in 2014 or whatever. Um, we do encourage developers to do what they can uh, with regard to um, development, but we can't force them because we haven't got the policies. Um, and I, I don't disagree with Councillor Abbs's aspirations, but we've got to determine these applications on the current policies before us. And it's okay saying, well, we'll test policy CS15, but I don't think the test would stand up to be perfectly honest, because it's been so weakened by um, the um, Code for Sustainable Homes being discontinued from planning and put into building control. We were absolutely furious about it at the time. And so I understand totally where Councillor Abbs is coming from, but I think there's got to be a level of acceptance that we are where we are. Um, and I agree with Councillor Culver. She mentioned that, you know, the three... Um, tests for, um, uh, for for planning are social, economic and environmental. And we have given a very strong steer to officers uh, post uh, in the COVID recovery period that they've got to really give more weight to the economic aspect of planning. And I think this application covers that. I think uh, I agree that the um, uh, Parish Councillor for Lambour made a very eloquent uh, presentation uh, and it was very good. But I'm I'm also surprised because Lambourne has always been such a strong supporter of the horse racing industry and I'm a little disturbed that they are now thinking otherwise um, because Lambourne is such an important uh, centre for racing in this country and I think we've got to do everything to support the racing industry and it as, as, as set out in policy CS12. Um, Thank you Chairman. Councillor Cole and I think we all agree with uh, the frustration with policy as it uh, currently 
stands. Uh, Councillor Abs. Yes, Chairman, I, I do want to come back on that, and I, I totally appreciate where uh, Councillor Cole's coming from, because she, she was one of the people that uh, helped define CS15 in the first place, so I don't think it's just my aspiration. I thought it, thought, what I thought it was West Barchers. But to be clear, one of the reasons I'm pushing for it and uh, I will, you're going to hear me t mention it time again, is because our own officers at the Sandalford Inquiry said that it still applied. They argued at the QC level that it applied. So if, if our own officers at that level are arguing during the Sandalford Inquiry that it should apply, then we have to back them in that. Because one of the arguments of the opposing QC is, is well, you've never done it anywhere, so it can't apply. And what we're doing is we're, we're carrying on with that narrative and we need to change the narrative. We actually need to support our, our Nick, I've got to get this wrong, so Geocopolis. I've probably got the surname completely wrong, Nico is for short. But, uh, you know, I, I sat there watching the whole thing and, you know, I was convinced that we could still use CS15. So I'm, I'm a little saddened to hear us arguing that we can't. So. Mr. Phil. Chairman, um, it's important to, dis uh, to draw the distinction between the works um, involved in the Sandalford development, which are um, major residential development works, which um, draw the economies of scale that are relevant to residential works and therefore um, where widespread implementation of um, renewable technology um, and sustainability measures um, is something that can be built from the ground up. Imposing that onto um, individual residential dwellings um, it, that, that are of a minor character and nature um, in a, a unsustainable area um, in terms of residential development is a very different proposition. And I would caution members that um, the character of an appeal um, against a refusal on these grounds um, in this case would be extremely different to the character of an appeal against a refusal um, in the case of Sandalford Park, um, given that the character of the two forms of development are essentially fundamentally different. Um, and um, I, I have concerns um, regarding the adequacy of policy CS15 um, to support a refusal in this case where I wouldn't have those concerns regarding Sandalford Park. Thank, Thank you, Chairman. You. Thank you very much, Mr. Till. Uh, I think I can uh, guess exactly where Mr. Uh, Councillor Abs very, very much, is, very is much going so, to go, Chairman. but Councillor Abs. Just, it's just that this one has the letters MAG on, MAJ on the end, major, it doesn't have minor. So we, that's why I, I'm, I'm happy that uh, we are, because before I've been told this must be major developments, it clearly says MAG on the end, full major. So uh, it should apply in my mind. Thank you, Councillor Abs. Uh, any further contributions? I have a proposal uh, from Councillor Kant. Uh, does that find a seconder? Councillor Cole, thank you very much. Uh, members, a show of hands, please, for those in favour of accepting officers' recommendation, please. One, two, three, four, five. That's, uh, so. Jack, we're happy with the names and numbers. Yes. Thank you, members. Uh, and can I have a show of hands, please, against? Councillor Abs, thank you. And abstentions, Councillor Wilston and Councillor Moore, thank you very much. Indeed. Um, members, thank you. Uh, a very, very interesting um, and well argued uh, debate. Um, and um, members have agreed to accept officers' recommendation and approve uh, that application. That concludes the business of the evening. Thank you, members, very much indeed. Officers, thank you very much. Officers, both in the chamber and upstairs. Thank you for your contributions and uh, wise steerings. Uh, thank you very much, and I draw the meeting to a close. <laughs>